pressures on the Fed here that you have an overheating economy. Perhaps the economy is not slowing as fast as anticipated. Growth is going to slow down. We're all going to be watching the Fed, whether they blink. We're still in that camp of 75 basis points in the July meeting. They need to move now. Those consequences will come later, and hopefully they won't have to go too much higher too much later. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keen, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Back in the sea, it's Bramo. Welcome back, Lisa Bramo. It's just good Thanks. to see you. Futures negative right on cue. Down six tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down eight tenths of 1%. TK, Euro, dollar, about that close from breaking 101 all over again. Yeah, the dollar is a store today with a 107.71 on DXY. The lead for Global Wall Street this morning is continued dollar strength. It bears watching. It bears watching against the yen. But, John, I would suggest between the earnings later in the week and critically the CPI guess uh, that we get in the 13th, uh, maybe that Trump's dollar study right now. What are you focused on, Tom? CPI Wednesday, earnings Thursday. What's the bigger issue for you going through the next couple of weeks? I, I think the bigger issue is guidance from corporations. I mean, I mean, Robert Schiffman, uh, writing uh, from vacation this morning for Bloomberg Intelligence, made clear he thinks big tech has a quality stream in the second half of this year. We need to get guidance. It's going to be nuanced guidance. I think it helps, John, corporations to be clearer this time around than normal. Lisa, you've been missed. Let's put the two stories together. The dollar strength and the earnings story we're expecting and the work of Mike Wilson and the team over at Morgan Stanley over the weekend. Some big news, some big numbers in that particular report. Basically saying that the move that we've seen so far in the dollar, the strengthening of somewhere uh, north of 10 percent, 11 percent, is uh, commensurate with a much bigger decline in earnings per share than people currently are pricing in. We hear companies worry about the strong dollar and what the fall through effects will be. How much do we see that really baked into estimates in a way that surprises to the downside? Hey, don't you love how Mike gets your Sunday started? He concludes by saying the recent rally in stock is likely to fizzle out before too long. Enjoy your Sunday. <laughs> Lisa, when it comes to earnings, that's the great divide between the bulls and the bears going through the rest of this year. It comes down to just that, that E. Well, and it's it's not just the bulls and the bears on the macro side, but it's the bulls that you see in the corporate specific analyst side versus the macro strategists who tend to be much more gloomy. How much do we get a reckoning that sends markets in one way or another? Frankly, I think that this week, more than the CPI, earnings are going to be the big picture to watch. Can I just squeeze this in too, Tom? Commodities, just briefly. Crude breaking down again. Copper's yeah. been breaking down since March. Your thoughts on that? I thought a number of shops rode up the weekend. I thought J.P. Morgan was particularly strong uh, on hydrocarbons, but also, John, copper. Is, you know, I, I never liked the phrase Dr. Copper. We'll let Chris Verone talk about that. But Chicago Copper's down, call it 27 percent. LME Copper's not where it was July 6th. But nevertheless, there's a weight there. That's a pun, John. And China, China facing potentially more restrictions. I got the pun, Tom. Thank you. It was pretty funny, kind of. Futures down to six or seven tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down about nine tenths of 1%. Look at Euro dollar, very close again to breaking 101. Wow. 10103 wow. with negative eight tenths of 1%. And, and as TK pointed out, Tom, <clears throat> just dollar strength right the way through G10 this morning. Last week on our sojourn to Washington, yen didn't break. It is broken. And this is not about the Abe assassination. It's about the elections. It may be a calm there. So weaker yen, 137. Lisa, your 10-year, 3.0691. 1% yields in a basis point. Welcome back. Thank you. It is good to be back. A lot happened last week, obviously. I was tracking it and your excellent job uh, that you guys did. I want to pick up, though, on the euro, that 101 level, and really uh, key that off of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which is uh, shutting today for 10 days for maintenance. The fear is that Russia does not bring these gas supplies back online. What does that do since Germany into recession? That seems to be the feeling. And if the biggest economy in the euro region goes into recession, that that is negative for the euro, regardless of what the ECB does. How does the ECB respond to this? How do they deal with the potential for financial instability? And this really is a similar story to what we see over in the United Kingdom at 10.15 a.m. We have Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey speaking on financial stability. How much does he key off of the weakening in the pound? One, does, uh, one commenter on uh, Twitter this morning talked about how at least the pound wasn't the euro today. And that is the best that they could say uh, with the pound at uh, one below 
121.19. And then uh, coming into the end of the day, we are looking for an auction for three-year treasuries. Uh, the $33 billion of three-year notes are going to be sold. And I know, Tom, you watch this carefully. I want to see the yield curve inversion on this space as we've seen that yield curve inversion continue in the 210 space. John, we are looking for a fourth consecutive day of a yield curve inversion at a time when people are getting increasingly pessimistic. You know, this is top of the list when it comes to what Tom missed when you were away over the last week. Lisa, <laughs> Auctions. The oh, yeah. Auctions for the Treasury. Yeah. Lisa, thank you so much. Twitter is one to watch in the pre-market. Getting slammed in a way that you might have anticipated, <clears throat> down and down hard by 7%. Truist put out some research this morning, Tom. If Twitter fails to bring the acquisition to completion, we would see the base case for the shares trading in the high 20s, reflecting yeah. 25 to 30% <clears throat> further downside from where we've been. Uh, Twitter hired Wachtell. And who knows who Mr. Musk is going to hire. He has a relationship with Kravitz. But, John, this is going to be absolutely fascinating. In Delaware, in the Chancery Court, which is the most British court we have, there's no jury, John, just very, very competent uh, uh, people. And I, I tell you, this is, it's, is it going to be original law? I'm not qualified to say that. But it's going to be a real interesting thing to see Mr. Musk, as we know him, before the straight guys out of, in, in Delaware. It's 34, be something. 23 in the pre-market. Let's pick things up with Chris Farone, the partner and head of technical and macro strategy at Strategus, a bad company. Chris, let's start here. Something you're focused on. You put together what's happened with commodities. You looked at equities, staples versus discretionary. Can you just run through that research? It was a great note, Chris. Just what have you learned? Yeah, well, I think a couple things. I say, number one, as you point out this morning, I mean, the action is in the currency market right now. When you look at... FX vol and bond vol, it doesn't seem to jive with equity VIX in the mid-20s. So I think there's something off there that will be resolved with greater equity vol uh, in our future here. As far as the leadership backdrop of this market, I think relationships like discretionary versus staples or high beta versus low beta give us really helpful clues on the market's perception of risk. And, you know, we've taken commodities down sharply. We've taken oil down 25 or 30 bucks. And discretionary has given us nothing, right? right? So this idea that some, some pause in crude or some weakness in crude would suddenly recatalyze the consumer, I think the market is suggestive of that not being the case here yet. Chris, you've got a beautiful, beautiful slide on short interest. Where's the gloom on Amazon? Where's the gloom on Apple, et cetera? Yeah. Give us a clinic right now, a mini clinic on short interest and the lack thereof. It, it, you know, Tom, this, this has really, really surprised us that, you know, S&P is down 20, NASDAQ is down 30. But when you look at the stocks that I think are viewed as most vulnerable or weakest here, these mega cap growth names, the short interest is just nowhere to be found. I mean, let's take, for instance, something like an Amazon. The short interest on Amazon is 1% of the public float. The stock has gone nowhere for two years. It doesn't make any sense to us. At the 2009 lows, you were talking about short interest of 13 or 14 percent on Amazon. You know, look at Tesla. Tesla, the short interest is 3 percent. That's down from 30 percent in 2019. So where is the short interest in the names where I think people should be most bearish on? I think that speaks to this overall level of complacency that I would argue still exists. And Chris, going back to what you initially said, perhaps the stress yeah. is being felt in the currency market. And just as we're speaking, the euro did break yeah. that 101 level. It is below that now, heading very close to parity. At what point does this mean that something is breaking that's going to create something more significant in the rest of markets? You know, that's a great question. And this is one of the reasons why we've, we've been reluctant to make the capitulation call. Like, I, I get that the market's oversold. I get you can bounce. But have we seen a true capitulation when the forces driving this market are very, very macro-oriented? This is a currency and bond-driven market right now. And when I see dollar yen at 137, when I see euro at parity, I still think we're headed towards some collision here or some moment yeah. where some bodies float to the surface. And, you know, our call has been it's the BOJ that ultimately is going to have to blink here. And the yen right. will weaken until the BOJ does. And now, folks, with Chris Verone, your CTA moment of the month. Chris, not how do you pick a bottom, but once you get out of a bottom, Let's go all John Maggie, 1946. How do you establish a bull trend? Is it off moving averages? Is it off a jump condition where the gap doesn't fill? 
technically, how do you know up? Yeah, it's a great question, and this is something we read about often. How do you distinguish between just a bounce or the start of the real thing? And it's always been our experience that the beginning of a new trend is preceded or accompanied with unmistakable momentum. You get these momentum surges coming off lows. One of the ways we look at that on any given day, the percentage of issues that are giving you a two standard deviation advance. So urgency, people chasing moves higher. We haven't seen it yet. Now, it doesn't mean we can't see it, but we haven't seen it yet. So those are the conditions we're looking for. I don't think they're in place here. We continue to remain prudent. This is a market that's bounced here over the last couple of weeks, but without, without a lot of momentum behind it. Hey, Chris, great to catch up to get your views. To look a little closer at what's been Good happening. Chris Farone, thank you very much. Down a half of 1% on the S&P. Looking at some really interesting levels in the FX market. Euro dollar very briefly a break of 101. We're at that level right now. Euro dollar 101 and dollar yen 137. And Tom, if you looked cross asset at the macro picture right now, the yen is really the thing that just hasn't participated this yes. year in a way that well, some people last week might expect. I'd say the whole year, Tom. The fact we've got yeah. yen weakness yeah, I, and not I'll yen strength in this environment just speaks to the moment I, that we're in. The advantage we have, folks, is on the, the fancy Bloomberg launch pad. I can look at 20 currency pairs, and you get a cadence to it. And it varies day to day, John. The headline today is yen weakness out right now. One, uh, My eyes are failing me 137. here. 137. Oh, thank you, Lisa. 137. Oh, wait. What I learned there... Uh, 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 John, what I learned there uh, from Chris Verone is simple. He's just in search of Bramo Gloom. He hasn't found it. Good to have Bramo back. Futures, yeah. a negative a half of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down about 7 tenths of 1%. Son of Desire is coming up of Franklin Templeton at 7 a.m. Eastern time. That's in about 50 minutes from New York City. For our audience worldwide, heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Shares of Twitter falling today. The company's preparing to go to court to force Elon Musk to follow through with his commitment to buy it for $44 billion. Bloomberg's learned that a filing in the Delaware Court of Chancery could happen as soon as today. The court has rarely sided with parties who, like Musk, are attempting to bail on acquisition commitments. In the UK, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss is the latest to enter the race to replace Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. She's making tax cuts the heart of her campaign. She wrote in the Daily Telegraph that she would start cutting taxes from day one. Truss joins 10 other candidates in the race. The timetable for the leadership contest is expected to be set out later today. France's finance minister is warning that Europe must prepare for Russian gas deliveries to be shut off entirely in retaliation for sanctions. Bruno Le Maire called it the most likely scenario. He said the French government is trying its best to avoid energy shortages. And President Biden says the administration is still discussing possible action regarding U.S. tariffs on Chinese imports. The U.S. is considering easing some of the Trump era duties. Meanwhile, the president and Chinese leader Xi Jinping are set to speak again in the coming weeks. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke with China's foreign minister over the weekend to lay the groundwork for a call. The president of Sri Lanka has agreed to resign hours after demonstrators stormed his official residence. Gotabaya Rajapaska had stayed in office during months of protests over fuel shortages, surging prices and financial mismanagement. Sri Lanka is in talks with the IMF on a loan program to help pay for imports of both food and fuel. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tape, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This Fed isn't stopping. This Fed is going to do 75 basis points and when it meets this month. And this Fed needs to catch up, John. They're not just reacting, they are catching up. And that's why they simply cannot wait. The brilliant Mohammed Al Arian from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures negative a half of 1%, recovering just a little bit on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down six or seven tenths of 1%. Where do you want to start this morning? Euro dollar very close to breaking and staying below 101. It <clears> broke <throat> that level in the last 15 minutes or so. Right now, Euro dollar 101. 
3.06. Yields come in about a basis point to 3.0691%. On a 10-year in the commodity market, we're down about 2% on crude. 102 handle on WTI. And Tom, a lot of questions about perhaps more restrictions on the world's second largest economy very, very soon. Yeah, we, we've seen that, and and there's any number of ways to go here. I would note, John, that you know, on a sleepy Monday, it's not sleepy. DXY is reaching out, as you correctly state, on week euro there. John, can I note that Dr. Elarian had my tweet of the weekend? He wrote a blistering short tweet that basically said, with all the fancy people like Mohammed Elarian, stop worrying about the partitions of inflation. It is the gross amount of inflation that is crushing society. I thought the way he did it was with a lot of grace. I hear you. He's worried about the stickiness of this, Tom. He thinks that's the most important question yeah, right I now. I agree with that. To your point, you yeah. could come down from nine, eight, seven, six. Do you <clears> settle <throat> at five, four? And how much longer do we need to deal yeah. with that? And again, that's what folks, when I talk about the x-axis and you move along the x-axis, that's something the media doesn't talk about too often. They're much more interested in the ups and downs of 8, 8.8, 8.9. Nobody's at 9%. Emily Wilkins is not at 9% inflation with Bloomberg government. She knows the x-axis of the Biden administration. What an interesting weekend for this president of the United States, Emily. He goes to Riyadh. He's got a to-do list, but he is distracted by the issue of his age, his health, health, the energy to get to the midterm elections. I mean, this is something that's plagued President Biden from the time that he was campaigning agreed, for agreed. the presidency, an argument that was made against him. And the fact of the matter is, is that the presidency is going to age anyone. Like, take any picture of any gut person at the start of their yep. presidency. At the end, you can see the aging. Biden's got that right now. And there's really no amount that the White House can do in terms of messaging, in terms of other things that would change that. And there have also been concerns about just how much Biden's been able to interact with the press one-on-one, -on -one, the amount of times he's sat down for interviews, the amount of times he's held briefings. All of those have sort of given Republicans a bit of an advantage in pushing the narrative that perhaps right. Biden should only be a single-term president. Riyadh is not Bavaria. Riyadh is not Madrid. How will this trip be different than what we observed on the Tadeo Hordern uh, sojourn? I would say it's sort of the main thing here is that Biden doesn't necessarily have the support of his entire party behind him for this trip and for these meetings with Mohammed bin Salman uh, and others in Saudi Arabia. There are definitely concerns about what Biden is doing, debate over whether, whether, whether he should be engaging at all. And you really saw that this weekend in the op-ed that Biden wrote in the Washington Post, really defending his reasons for this trip, laying out the goals of what he wants to do. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not still strong criticism within his own party for him taking this trip and really questions about what exactly is going to come out of this one and what the future of well, the U.S. relationship with the Middle East will be. Emily, I want to pick up on that point, the futility. And this was sort of the theme that I felt in a lot of the criticism about this trip to the Middle East. What can he actually get from this other than simply making promises to Riyadh in return for something that's ambiguous considering the fact that they don't have that much capacity to pump more? Is there a cohesive narrative that you're hearing and do we get the sense that there frankly is a tacit admission of policy failure when it comes to trying to isolate Russia and the damage that it has done in terms of their gas and oil supplies on the U.S. and European economies? Lisa, I think you really hit the nail on the head, head, nail on the head there. There are a lot of concerns and a lot of issues that could be discussed during this potential trip, but really a big question about what, if any, outcomes they're going to be. Certainly gas prices are on the top of everyone's mind right now, but as you know, there's not really a sense that we are going to suddenly see gas prices drop back to $3 after this particular trip. Um, Biden has also talked about just the importance of having a relationship with the Middle East and with with Middle East leaders. He's certainly meeting with a number of different countries' leaders on this particular trip. And he's talked about needing to sort of move forward in that relationship and have a constructive relationship well, with various countries in the Middle East. But Emily, I want to tie this to the idea of tariffs on Chinese goods, which is also something that perhaps this administration is thinking of doing, lifting some of the tariffs. Is there a sense that any of the policy measures currently being proposed by this administration could have a material effect on an inflation rate with headline inflation heading toward 9% at this week's reading. 
I mean, even Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said this weekend that even if they did have a reduction of tariffs on China, something that she is pushing for on consumer goods, it's not going to have a dramatic impact on inflation. You might see the price lower for some goods that a lot of Americans tend to consume, but you're not going to have that be an overall massive impact on inflation. And this is where this Biden administration is really trying to figure out what to do with inflation, because it's not something that they control. It's something that has a lot of factors going Going on at the same point, Biden's the one in the White House. That means he needs to be addressing it. He needs to be figuring out ways to move forward on it. And I think that's partly what we're seeing with this trip, partly what we're seeing with this tariff discussion about these tariffs on Chinese goods. Uh, just the administration, administration really trying to figure out a path forward here when there's not really a clear answer of what the White House can do to lower inflation, something that's a big issue for a lot of Americans right now and going to be a big issue this November. Emily Wilkins, thank you. Down in D.C. and Bramo, we've talked about this multiple times, haven't we? It's awkward, beyond awkward. There's some real tension between the criticism from this administration towards the Chinese Communist Party and the potential to remove some of the tariffs on Chinese goods. Especially because there isn't a very clear benefit in terms of how much that could reduce headline inflation. And that's why I talk about that feeling of futility. What are you sacrificing on one side and what are you gaining on the other? And there have to be some real discussions about that. Looking ahead to CPI on Wednesday, just a sneak peek at a survey. I'll put all the numbers out tomorrow for you. 8.9% is the estimate from BNP. HSBC at 8.9, TD at 8.9, getting close to 9, Tom. The headline median estimate, 8.8. .8. If you look for core, we're looking for that to come in just a little bit. So a bit softer on core, perhaps, but headline inflation, TK, that could be a big number. Yeah, I, I agree the core is where the analysis should be for global Wall Street. But, John, I actually looked today, and there's a lot of fancy math Bloomberg goes through on this. Uh, John, 8.8 .8 is the median number. When you look at the the uh, probability distribution of the survey, it's a little lower. It's skewed a little bit down. So I, I think the hysteria is toward 8.7-ish and not 9-ish. The low estimate is 8.1. The high estimate yeah, is 8.9. Equity futures down four tenths of 1% on the S&P, yielding a single basis point on a US 10-year. And look out euro dollar. Very briefly, a break of 101. Some real dollar strength to kick off a brand new trading week. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, here's the price action this Monday morning. Good morning. Futures just a little bit softer. We're down a half of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down 7 tenths of 1%. Remember, leaving behind a decent week of gains on the S&P, up 2%. On the Nasdaq 100, up a little more than 4.5. A decent week of gains in the face of a market that was pushing yields higher once again. Let's look at Treasuries, twos, tens and thirties. Last week, up more than 20 basis points on twos, up more than 20 basis points on tens. Your two-year, 3.078%, just a little bit higher than your 10-year. That curve inversion sticks. What was interesting about last week is yields higher and equities were OK. But also, on Friday, yields higher off the back of an upside surprise on a payrolls report and a euro that actually rallied to finish the day stronger. Euro dollar very close to breaking and sticking below 101 this morning. A break a little bit earlier, then back above it again. Euro dollar at 10106, negative eight tenths of 1%. Yeah. So once again, Tom, a lot of dollar strength. But I wonder what you made of the price action on Friday. Steve Englander of Standard Chartered said that told you a lot about positioning, how things developed in Friday's session. I just wonder, mm. Tom, whether well, that euro dollar move, how much downside we've got from here. I, I don't have a handle on that. I will mention that Barry Eichengreen with a tour de force and Project Syndicate and written up in The Guardian, John, in full uh, as well. He was exceptionally negative on United Kingdom productivity. You know, he went back to Eichen Green 101. And Barry's not in the business of saying 118 or 117. But, it, it, you know, it, it, it had a, an appropriate level, John, of Bramwell yeah. gloom. Jordan Rochester of Nomura, Tom, you've read re his research yeah. in the last couple of weeks. He thinks we can get down to 115 maybe even yeah. lower on cable. Right now, 119.42. <clears throat> if you ask him, this dollar move against certain currency right. stories has got more upside. Into July and into August, you need a book to read. There's any number of books. My, my book of the year, I've already said, is Angela Stent's Tour de Force on Putin. Let me drag out a book from a summer ago, and this is Richard Haas's The World 
Simple as that. A brief introduction. The world. It is an absolute tour de force to provide stability to your thinking forward. Ambassador Haas joins us this morning from the Council on Foreign Relations. Richard, I'm going to look at the last chapter of your effort, and instead of the liberal world order, I'm going to say, what is the liberal Biden order as he goes to Riyadh? He seems to be walking on eggshells here. Well, I think the word liberal is uh, taking a back seat uh, out of reality or, or necessity. And what the United States has decided to do is to put its preferences on the back burner. And on the front burner, you've got its very hard interests, Tom, not simply oil output, but also greater collaboration and coordination against an emerging Iranian nuclear and non-nuclear threat in uh, the Middle East. I think there's a longer term hope that the Saudis will at some point join the diplomatic process and normalize relations with Israel. But the near-term priorities are clearly oil and Iran. The near-term priorities are there, but there's also embedding some form of foreign policy of State Department recovery from what many people say is the chaos of the Trump years. What's the Haas scorecard on getting State back to normalcy? State Department is not back to normalcy. It still looks pretty weak to me as, uh, as a, a, an agency. Uh, the, much foreign policy is being run out of the White House. The National Security Council has become an enormous behemoth. It's got a large operational role. It's more than 10 times the size of the National Security Council I served on several decades ago when Brent Scowcroft was President Bush, the father's national uh, security advisor. So I think that's simply the that's simply the you know, the changed reality of how the United States designs and conducts foreign policy. So, Richard, uh, given the fact that the near term priorities, as you say, are oil and Iran and right now getting oil production up potentially from the Middle East, how much of a detriment is it to see a lack of cohesion in the cabinet? A fact that you're getting people pushing back and saying this is a useless trip who belong to Biden's own team. Well, lack of cohesion in the, the cabinet is probably as old as the republic uh, itself. The fact that it's a bit more vocal is, is never a good sign. And it might be consistent with a, a little bit of exhaustion, a fact that some of the, the polls are suggesting that things, needless to say, are not uh, going well. Plus, there are real debates here about the centrality or what ought to be the centrality of uh, values and human rights and democracy. I think the Biden administration makes a big mistake in promoting it. Uh, not that these things are not important, but you know, take the Ukraine uh, situation. The, the Biden administration has cast it as almost the forces of light against darkness. But the big problem is most of the world is not democratic. So they're not going to join a struggle that's cast in light in, in the framing of democracy against authoritarianism. The only real issue that the rest of the world is prepared to sign on to is countries ought not to get invaded by other countries. I think the Biden administration would be much smarter. But Lisa, let me just say one other thing. All this pressure on the trip, what's it going to deliver? That, to me, is just silly. This is an investment in a relationship. You've got this crown prince who's probably going to be running this important country for another 50 years. Oil will remain important for most of those years, if not all of them. The United States needs to reestablish a relationship. You can't leave them in the penalty box forever. So what matters is not what comes out of this trip in terms of a communique. What matters is that the United States and Saudi Arabia are once again seriously talking. Well, this is important, Richard, and it goes to the op-ed that President Biden penned in the Washington Post over the weekend. This is what he was emphasizing. It's a diplomatic relationship. But does the fact that there is so much discussion around possible oil production that is fueled by the same White House indicate the sort of futility of trying to fight the inflationary wave that's coming from so many different places, especially at a time when there are very few remedies? Well, you know, a couple of increasing soy output by a, by a modest amount is going to have a negligible dent in inflation. I, I, you know, it just doesn't make uh, sense. Plus, the critical item in terms of the war is not oil output. Oil is fungible. It's gas. And figuring out a way to wean Europe on, uh, on Russian gas and getting more liquefied natural gas over to, to Europe. But you know, whatever, whatever happens in the way of oil prices is going to be negligible. The administration's got to get rid of these tariffs on, uh, on China. And it, it, there's still the work that the Fed has a lot of work to do on, on winding up quantitative uh, easing on, on rates. There's still questions about fiscal stimulus, too much of it. So what happens in Saudi Arabia is going to yeah. be at the margins. 
Ambassador, one of the great things we do on surveillance is we always look behind our guests to the bookcase to see what they actually read <laughs> and what they not talk about. Uh -oh. You have What's one of the account? great, great books out there on Woodrow Wilson in 1915 in his speech, Too Proud to Fight. We don't need to go into that now as a clinic. That was a special example that Wilson perceived of America. What is our special example right now post-Trump? What's interesting, let's just go on Woodrow Wilson. He, more than anyone else, Tom, represents one of the basic themes or schools of American foreign policy. And in some ways, it's a perfect setup for this trip uh, by, the, by President Biden. Woodrow Wilson had a very uh, positive, almost evangelical approach to the world, very idealistic. And ultimately, he got overwhelmed. He got ground up by both domestic politics that rejected the League of Nations and internationally, he just got beat up at the Paris Peace Conference. And I think what you're seeing with the Biden administration, you've got all these uh, progressive idealist people and they're getting mugged by reality in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, now in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That is the lesson of Woodrow Wilson. Richard, tie that then to what you just said moments ago that actually is quite controversial, that you think that it's necessary to get rid of the tariffs on Chinese goods. Do you think uh, that this would actually have a material effect on inflation, or do you think that from a diplomatic reason this is uh, beneficial? I think it would have a modest impact on both. Uh, you know, the impact on inflation, you know, a few decimal points never, never hurts. Ultimately, the only way to deal with inflation is going to be incrementally, and that would be one of the ways you would do it. And these, these tariffs were put in place to reform dramatically the Chinese economy. They haven't worked. What they're doing is mainly penalizing Americans. So at some point, you, know, you try a tool. In this case, the Trump administration didn't think it through, slapped them on. Uh, the Biden administration should get rid of them. My hunch is they're scared to get rid of them because they don't want to look weak on China. But that's a silly way to conduct foreign policy. Do smart stuff and the politics will take care of themselves. Richard, wonderful to hear from you, as always. Richard Haas <clears throat> there of the Council on Foreign Relations. Tom, that famous line, mugged by reality on several fronts. Well, it is. I mean, it's a changed landscape, and that's what happens. Where's oil right now? Brent crude. I mean, we're all breathing a sigh of release of 105, John, down from 124 on Brent crude. But take that 105 price from a year ago, two years ago. That's the reality that set it. Clearly changing course on their approach towards the Middle East, to Richard Haas's point. <clears throat> on China, at least, that's quite a line to hear from Richard Haas come out and say they need to get rid of these tariffs on China. That seems to be the direction of travel. The president over the weekend mentioning he's still not made a decision on that. We reported on Friday that he had a meeting with advisors. Not clear what the outcome of that meeting actually was. The fact that Richard said that it has failed, that these tariffs have failed to actually penalize China and instead of have penalized American companies and consumers is an interesting and notable progression. How do they position this yeah. argument, though, really will be the incremental decline in inflation, which is a hard sell at okay. a time when it's getting it down from, what, 8.1 percent, 8.9 percent, depending on the estimate, down to, what, 8.8 percent, right? I mean, it's sort of what level are we talking about here? John, in advance, every single academic effort, and I would defer to Dan Tannenbaum, the expert on this, tariffs penalize your domestic players, not the party at hand. And that's the issue with Russia and the oil price cap as well. So, Tom, what would you suggest they do when it comes to China? <clears throat> do you think it sends the right message? I think it's, it sends messaging and tariffs and sanctions, frankly, all changed 40, 50 years ago with South Africa. We were all shocked at how ter uh, sanctions actually worked against apartheid. So, you know, it's not that I'm critical of them, but I think we have to understand the, the price theory, the microeconomics of how it works through. And the answer is tariffs affect Apple way more than they affect China. Lisa, final word on this. I just think that it's an interesting recalibration of what's been effective and what has been ineffective. And that goes also to some of these sanctions on Russian oil and gas. Futures down 21 on the S&P. We're down about a half of 1% to kick off a brand new trading week. Yields in a single basis point. Talk of more restrictions, COVID restrictions in China as the infection rate starts to creep higher in certain cities again. We're down by more than 2% on crude. WTI 102.41 from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The scene is set for a disruptive legal battle over the future of Twitter. Shares of the social media platform fell today after Elon Musk walked away from his $44 billion deal to buy the company. Musk alleges that Twitter misrepresented user data. Twitter plans to sue Musk to close the transaction.
The latest COVID outbreak in Shanghai is getting larger. The city recorded 69 new infections on Sunday. That is the most since late May. That is leading to more mass testing there. New subvariants of the virus are proving a constant challenge to China's zero tolerance approach. In Japan, the ruling coalition has expanded its majority in an upper house election. The vote was held two days after the killing of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who led the bloc to numerous victories during his time in office. The results could strengthen Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's grip over the Liberal Democratic Party. Former Trump advisor Steve Bannon has agreed to testify before the House committee investigating the riot at the Capitol. Donald Trump waived an assertion of execution privilege that sought to block Bannon's testimony. Bannon allegedly pressed the former president to try to stop the certification of Joe Biden's presidential victory. An Uber reportedly tied to lobby politicians and flouted laws as parts of efforts to expand globally from 2013 to 2017. Newspapers in the UK, US, UK and France are amongst those reporting on the so-called Uber files. Uber doesn't deny any of the allegations, but says it is a different company today. Global News, 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. made it very clear and he's gradually dialed things up soft landing softish landing now inflation uh, fighting inflation is our priority even if that means a slowdown so i think it made it pretty clear that it's going to take a lot for them to pause it was a chorus of 75s following payrolls friday 75 75 that's the rate hike you might get at the end of the month that was randy krosner the university of chicago booth school professor and former Fed Governor. Futures this morning, good morning, negative, a half of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, down six or seven tenths of 1%. The stock to watch in the pre-market, Twitter, down and down hard as Elon Musk, Tom, walks away. Twitter is down by a little less than 7%. We're negative 6.82% <clears throat> in the pre-market. This is not Judge Judy, John. This is going to be really, really interesting in the acclaimed Chancery Court of Delaware. There is no jury. There are judges. They are all business and they move things forward. I don't know who Mr. Musk has representation over the weekend from Twitter is Wachtell. Maybe it's Kravitz. Maybe it's somebody else. But this is a very different legal process than what we're used to. Are you suggesting that Judge Judy is not serious? Uh, I don't I mean, many know. People, uh, honestly, many I've never people seen Many people waking it. up this morning will be terribly disappointed in that, Tom. I, 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 did I get myself in trouble they there, They take John? that very, very seriously. <laughs> Is this really happening, John? Thank you. He, brought you it, really... he brought it up. I had Come to go on, there, didn't you're I? Gonna okay, do you know, I enjoy on. Judge Judy when it first came out? It was great. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to... Yeah, I know. Okay. Um, let us uh, move on here with futures negative 18, Dow futures negative 101. The VIX out of stick, 26.24. Talk about something John's way better at than I am, and that is this gas issue, natural gas issue, LNG issue of Europe. Sandra uh, Fippen is chief economist at AB and AMRO out of Erasmus with an encyclopedic knowledge of her, the Netherlands. Sandra, the Netherlands are out front on this. What can Germany learn from the complete shutoff or near shutoff of Denmark and the Netherlands? Well, that's a big question. Um, I think that um, there is not so much to learn for Germany because it is in a very different place. Germany's uh, natural gas dependence from Russia is uh, very high. Uh, it's the highest in, in, in Europe. Um, also, it's overall gas dependence uh, for its uh, energy provisions are uh, pretty high. So Germany is in a very uh, vulnerable place. That said, the Netherlands has contractual obligations to be solidary with <laughs> Germany in case of an energy emergency. And actually, there are many uh, countries which are uh, somewhat likely to be solidary in, term, in, in, in case of an emergency uh, energy supply crunch. So. Who speaks, to, who speaks to Mr. Putin about this? Is it the leadership of Germany, the leadership of the Netherlands? Is it utility companies? Who drives this discussion forward with these Russian threats that are now appearing to be reality? 
Well, I think we should realize that we're not anymore in the situation where Europe is the one uh, imposing sanctions uh, on the on the Russian uh, side. It's we're in an economic we've landed in an economic warfare. So today, the um, the pipeline of Nord Stream One um, shut down uh, from Russia to the uh, eurozone, and that that is for maintenance uh, reasons. That actually happens every year. But now, basically, we're all holding our breath to uh, to the question whether the pipeline is going to reopen um, after two weeks of maintenance. And um, the idea within Europe is that nobody is speaking to Russia. We are um, make, we are trying to uh, prepare for a situation where the gas is not going to flow uh, after two weeks. That's the issue, actually. Okay, so Sandra, let's game that out in terms of what that would do to the German economy. How deep of a recession would it be, and what does that do to the entire Euro region? Yeah, so um, it is too early to put an exact uh, GDP number on this, but there are a number of channels uh, which would immediately, uh, let's say, kick in. Um, the first is that there will be a kind of a, a search for immediate replacement opportunities. And of course, we already see that ongoing, right? We try to get a liquefied natural gas from every possible uh, place where we can get it from. Um, there are initiatives going on to uh, incentivize households and firms for initial, uh, additional energy savings. Um, we're looking to, uh, to, to fill strategic reserves, even if that means uh, reusing coal-fired power plants to um, uh, to provide electricity, so co so we can use the gas that's still coming in uh, in order to to fill those strategic reserves. We also have to be aware that those strategic reserves are basically meant to cover the difference between a normal winter and a very cold winter. It's not really intended to cover for a complete shut off of of gas. So uh, it's it, that is not oh. a, the only solution. Sandra, so what would happen then basically is there would, would be two channels of impact. One is that there is, of course, an immediate uh, energy price increase, even uh, much higher than we're currently seeing, which puts a margin squeeze on businesses and it's going to put some businesses out of activity. Then the second channel basically is through government intervention because the governments will consider industry stoppages in order to keep um, yeah, necessary gas flowing to to households at a minimum level and also to kind of crucial activities such as hospitals. Sandra, we have to leave it there. Important stuff. Sandra Flippin there of A and B AMRO. This just out from Citigroup and Vasilios Janakis. We estimate that euro dollar could slide below 95 wow. if supply of nat gas is cut off. So no. essentially, Tom, that's the call. If and it's a big if. As Nord Stream yeah. 1, as Lisa pointed out, the pipeline goes off for maintenance. The big question that Vasilios is trying to answer is what happens to euro dollar if it doesn't turn back on? Yeah, well, that could be a, you know, a force majeure thing where you've got some serious, serious international relations and such. But, John, I would look at the force majeure of double-digit inflation. As you mentioned earlier, not so much a single-point guesstimate of inflation, but the persistency, let's say, into September. Are we looking out to September yet? I don't think we're looking out to August. I can't get out to August right now, Tom. I think that's right. tremendously difficult. Lisa, if I look at the calls out on Friday after payrolls, most people went with 75 this month, down to 50 by the time you get to September, and then potentially coming back down to 25, 25, 25. There is a belief out there that this 75 basis point hike that a lot of people think we could get at the end of this month might be the last 75 basis point hike of this rate hiking cycle. But as you know, things have changed and changed quickly on one data point over the last few months. Yeah, and perhaps we'll get another data point that is the one data point to watch on Friday when we get the University of Michigan inflation expectations with the Consumer Sentiment Survey. The, the report, though, on Friday was confusing to me because you had that stronger than expected headline number. But if you looked under the hood, the household survey came in disappointing and the workforce shrank. How do you really parse out how much strength there is when it is a lagging indicator and there's a very different reality in the past three weeks than those prior? Isn't that the issue, though, for so many people, Lee? said that this is a commitment by this Fed to be late, to be late the other way <clears throat> this time, and perhaps the damage is done. Well, okay, and this is sort of when we start talking about are they going to tighten into a recession regardless, because that is the only thing that can get unemployment up to a level that can bring inflation down. 
you know, how long are we going to wait to see when the uh, when there the effects go. of tightening really go into place? The CPI on Wednesday, Thursday, bank earnings, JP Morgan, Mohammed on Friday, an avalanche of revisions coming our way in the next three to six months. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. pressures on the Fed here, that you have an overheating economy. Perhaps the economy is not slowing as fast as anticipated. Growth is going to slow down. We're all going to be watching the Fed, whether they blink. We're still in that camp of 75 basis points in the July meeting. They need to move now. Those consequences will come later, and hopefully they won't have to go too much higher too much later. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Back with Lisa Brown, I'm pleased to say, back in the sea after vacation. And Tom Keane apparently going away again next week. But we'll get to that yeah, later. I got a memo on we'll that. We'll get to that later. Oh, I knew I was Futures down that, a half yeah. of 1% on the S&P 500. TK CPI on Wednesday. Thursday, JP Morgan earnings. Friday, retail sales in America. Saturday, Lisa exits. Okay, anyways, there's the economic uh, data as well. You know, combine them all together, John. In, 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 things are so topsy-turvy now at the end of a pandemic and, frankly, with a little bit of concern over new variants that, like, where are we going to be for the Sunday talk shows? Where are we going to be for when Lisa's at JFK on the return flight to Crete? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, you know. Uh, the, the uncertainty here is extraordinary. Where's the dollar going to be at the Fed's next meeting? Higher. At the higher. End of it's got to go. It's, it's the it's Stronger the again this morning, resistant. Tom. Euro dollar briefly about yeah. an hour ago, a break of 101 again. Well, no, not only that, DXY 107.62, and you got yen participating today, 137.08. A 138 yen, John, is basically unimaginable. At least these are numbers we haven't seen on some yes. currency pairs for 20 years. Which raises questions about whether this is the transmission of something breaking down, because we have not seen it in risk assets. And that has been the notable feature to me. Even as we see the fastest pace of Fed tightening going back decades, we have not seen things break down except perhaps on the margins in some of these currency pairs. Do you think the BOJ can hang tough here? 137, <coughs> pushing 140? Okay, so people have been looking for them to cave. They've been betting against them. The, the mainstream thought is that the Bank of Japan can do it on their own terms. They can wait for the dollar to come off before they move away from the peg in terms of the yield curve. You know, honestly, I'm not going to weigh in further than that other sure. than to say this has been one node of stress, and you can see this. At what point does it have a fallout that's broader than just this pair? We're on the same page, though, when it comes to currency weakness. Tom, eight years ago, this was desirable for the Japanese authorities. And here oh, we are, it's anything but. I'm not sure anyone at G10 wants or needs a weak currency right now. Yeah, and, and the way I think the pros would answer this, John, is including Sunel Desai with their International Monetary Fund experience. It's not the vector of weak yen, it's if you get a rate of change delta. You have that, I think it's over the last five months, but does it get worse now or do we stay on some form of manageable trend? I would suggest that was the pros are much more interested in. We'll catch up with the Franklin Templeton fixed income CI <clears throat> in just a moment. Futures down a half of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, down seven tenths of 1%. We talked about the data this week. CPI Wednesday, retail sales on Friday. Yields up last week by more than 20 basis points. This morning, back to lower by two basis points to 3.0579%. We've touched on the FX market, that strong dollar, Bramo. Let's talk about crude. Down 2%, 102.61. And a lot of talk this morning about China. Yeah, and how much these shutdowns that we're seeing in Shanghai, as they do uh, track a number of new variant cases uh, emerge, how much are we looking at this being a consistent story versus sell what you can? And that seems to be a lot of what people were seeing at least last week. Also, very much with oil and gas today, the Nord Stream 1 pipeline is scheduled to shut off for maintenance. This is a routine scheduled shutdown for 10 days. The fear is that it's not going to come back. We just got that call from City that John highlighted showing that the euro could go down to 95 versus the Daro, 0.95 versus the U.S. 
dollar if this is shut off. How much is this the reason for the euro weakness? And I do wonder how much we're breaching thresholds that indicate that there is further downside. At 10.15 a.m., Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey is speaking on financial stability uh, if before the House of Commons. And again, this idea of financial stability, how much is that really pegged to currency pairs? And I'm also looking at the pound. The pound also declining today, 119.61, below that 120 mark. How low can it go? It is not desirable to have a weaker currency, as John was saying. It's also, though, not desirable necessarily to have a strong currency if you look at the dollar and what we're seeing on the other side. Is it enough to attract investors to the United States to buy bonds at a time of such high inflation? And we'll get the latest gauge on that at 1 p.m. U.S. Treasury is planning to sell $33 billion of three-year yes. notes. I know that, Tom, you'll be watching this very carefully through your closed eyes during the nap that you What's take the during so that period here? of time. The so what here is that you're seeing yields in the front eight and remain high even as you get that bid into the long end. How much do we see the consistency there as you do expect some sort of not recession, slowdown, stagflation, slowflation, or even recession baked into the yield curve? And John, I am watching that yield curve inversion that continues. Elisa nailed it. Tom, that's why you don't care about auctions. 1 p.m., you're sleeping. Got that I know right. that for a fact. Nap. That's the, that's the yeah. one hour of the day yeah. that I don't get a phone call yeah. ever. That bill it, insists no notifications. I'm aware. <laughs> It's a quote for you. We see a high probability that further hawkish surprises lie ahead, as even the current expected policy path would leave real interest rates negative well into next year. The team behind that quote, Franklin Templeton, the fixed income CIO, joins us right now. Son of design. Son of great to catch up with you. Walk me through why you still believe that we could face further hawkish surprises. So I think the surprises stop being surprises as the market starts expecting them, right? So we wrote that even before. Currently, I would say, I think that we, we're going to get an inflation number which is higher than 1% this, uh, this week, month on month terms. So we're getting close to nine. We might even trickle a little bit above nine this month. That's a big number. And I think it's going to be extremely difficult to end this year with inflation being significantly below eight, which means we're looking at seven and a half to eight percent for year end. And my concern is that regardless of where we are on Fed funds, whether we're at three or 3.25, <clears throat> it's not going to be enough. And the market currently is already pricing in rate cuts next year. That might just be way too soon. And that, that's the call, that we will actually see the Fed deliver getting closer to four <clears throat> But it will not spin on a dime and start cutting as soon as it hits four because it does need to get inflation out of the system. This happened once before in the 70s. They backed off too quickly and then inflation came back. This is a pretty bold call, uh, Sonal, and I'm wondering where you think on the yield curve it is most mispriced that there will be cuts to those, rate, uh, to those rates of the Fed next year. Where is it most mispriced that we're going to see inflation come down to a mere 5 or 6 percent versus what you're expecting of 8 percent? So I'd say that if I look at the yield curve, if I look at what is priced in looking forward, we are seeing tenure, we are seeing short-end rates pricing in uh, rate cuts in the second half of next year. And is that, that to me is a mispricing. Now the long end, it is interesting because I don't think that uh, current levels are uh, cheap. I think they're still rich. I think the long end does need to sell off more. Because the market is counting very much on the Fed being in a position to immediately cut rates once we get the slowdown in the economy, which clearly they're expecting and hoping for. That's only if inflation comes down as well. And if inflation doesn't come down, I don't think the Fed can cut rates, so now you even as the economy slows. Sorry. You, you yeah. mentioned the 1970s. Long ago and far away, when I could shave once a week, I was given a private meeting with Sir John Templeton. That began mm -hmm. a relationship over decades. And he told me then, pre-Volker, that there would be a shortage of bonds. Essentially, folks, John Templeton called the great moderation. Now, other people did as well. But boy, that was a lonely call. Is the great yeah. moderation over? So now, can you, with, you're, you're a morning star, fixed income manager of the year. Can you say, finally, we've broken through the trend of the great moderation? I think that the great moderation happened at a time when governments and central banks hadn't, were, were not coming off 15 years of various forms of QE from central banks and 
for governments at least three or four years of massively expansionary fiscal policy. So do I think that shortage of bonds is history? Eventually, it will come back again. But I think for the next three to five years, I don't see a shortage of bonds. So just quickly, I, I need to squeeze this in. We've got about 30 yeah. seconds with you. What's the big market call for you? I've heard the big Fed call, the big inflation call. What's the big market call? The big market call is much more volatility coming forward. I've heard in two weeks' time, we had treasuries, the deepest, apparently most liquid market in the in the world, rally 60 basis points. In two days' time, we had them sell off another 20 or 25 basis points. These types of moves are not done. So I'm not ready to make that call to say jump into risk assets. I think it's way too soon. Sonal, wonderful to catch up with you. Sonal Desai there of Franklin Templeton. Just listen to some of those calls, Lisa. I was making notes of them as she was speaking. 7.5 to 8% year-end inflation. Pricing yep. in rate cuts next year way too soon. The risk of the 1970s, something that Governor Waller himself on Friday was pushing back against, that they don't want to make that same mistake. And Lisa, I think people are getting comfortable with this consensus view that they have to slow down rate hikes over the next few meetings after this one. Which is the reason why you said that isn't the Fed committed to being late on the other side? And if so, this is a market that has not woken up to that possibility. The market call I thought was interesting at the end, Sanal saying that it's too early to go into risk assets at a time when a lot of people are going into risk assets. I looked at, uh, for example, the spread of the extra yield that investors earn over benchmark rates to own corporate bonds. <laughs> Tom, I'm doing this for you. <laughs> and it's actually Thank come you. in a lot. In other words, people are piling into this <clears throat> debt because they think that the yields are high. This is a good news story. And she's saying, look, you're getting things swinging around so much, you really can't say that. Spreads are tighter. Do we have to define that every single time now? <laughs> Apparently, Apparently do. so. I'm looking at yeah. Twitter in the pre-market. Things are turning around. The stock is down, down, Tom, by around about 5% and recovering pretty quickly <clears throat> over the last 30 minutes. Well, there it is. But the persistency of inflation, John, I think is, is a huge story here, as Dr. Desai talked about. And, you know, it is Calculus Monday. You really he, don't want to he, talk about Elon Musk this morning, do you? I don't want to talk about yeah, Elon Come that. on, he's going to Twitter. Delaware. Inflation. It's a cakewalk. He In has no hour. idea the buzzsaw he's going to run rock. into. And I think the Farrow family was in Chancery Court in like 1680. I'm, sh I'm pretty sure they were in the mines in Sicily or something, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Yields down a couple of basis points on a 10-year, 3.0598%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Shares of Twitter are falling today. The company's preparing to go to court to force Elon Musk to follow through with his commitment to buy it for $44 billion. Bloomberg's learned that a filing in the Delaware Court of Chancery could happen as soon as today. The court has rarely sided with parties who, like Musk, are attempting to bail on acquisition commitments. In the UK, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss is the latest to enter the race to replace Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. She's making tax cuts the heart of her campaign. She wrote in the Daily Telegraph that she would start cutting taxes from day one. She joins 10 other candidates in the race. The timetable for the leadership contest is expected to be set out later today. And the risk of a euro area recession is growing. That's according to economists polled by Bloomberg. The probability of an economic contraction has increased to 45% from 30% in the previous survey. The rising cost of living is taking an increasing toll on business and consumers. Meanwhile, the likelihood of natural gas shortages is increasing. President Biden says the administration is still discussing possible action regarding U.S. tariffs on Chinese imports. The U.S. is considering easing some of the Trump era duties. Meanwhile, the president and Chinese leader Xi Jinping are set to speak again in the coming weeks. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke with China's foreign minister over the weekend to lay the groundwork for a call. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tape, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The president is being thoughtful about this. If he decides to lift certain tariffs, it will be because he knows he has to 
think about doing everything he possibly can to provide any relief to consumers. Um, but he's going to do it in a thoughtful way that is strategic and also most important, most important to him and to all of us is without hurting American workers. Gina Ramondo there, the U.S. Secretary of Commerce on NBC over the weekend from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Rambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures look like this on the S&P 500 and on the Nasdaq 2. On the S&P, down a half of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, down six tenths of 1%. Yields down a couple of basis points after seeing a serious lift through last week of more than 20 basis points. So now desire Franklin Templeton on with us just moments ago, suggesting that volatility, Tom, is here to stay. Yeah, the persistency is the word of the morning, John, and maybe not with yen, 137.11, a full stick on yen, finally catching up with weak euro. But, you know, I, I would say the theme on a Monday morning where you were trying to set up for the economic data is what is going to be the lengthiness, the durationness of this inflation series. CPI on Wednesday, then on to Others retail sales optimistic. on Friday. It could be sticky. Others are more optimistic. A lot of people also yeah. think that perhaps this Fed backs off, Tom, before it gets inflation well, back down to 4 3 2% because the growth figures are that undesirable. You and I heard this in Washington, the idea of demand uh, destruction. Moments ago, Ian Lingen, BMO Capital, he's joined us here, John, in our studios recently. He says, what's it going to take to have a talk huh. from 75 beeps out to 100 beeps? One full percentage point lift by the Fed. I'm not going to pour cold water over that. I just remind everyone of what happened at the last yeah. meeting. We went into it looking for 50, and then we got some reports, <clears throat> and all of a sudden it was 75 yeah. based on a very small data point. I, I don't know. We'll have to see. He talks about nine-ish, and that's not in the survey right now. Always looking at surveys in Washington. Emily Wilkins joins us with Bloomberg Government and does so. We talked earlier about the president and a planned trip abroad. Let us talk about the president and which state he should visit in the United States. Where's his biggest headache politically in America? Might I suggest Georgia? Georgia would definitely be a good choice. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest, Tom. I could answer that question a number of different ways here. Certainly, Georgia is going to be one of the states that decides whether or not Democrats are going to keep the Senate. Pennsylvania is another one. Ohio is another one. You've got lots of things that Biden could be doing. And I think, Tom, what that really does is it speaks to the fact that the Democrats and President Biden, what is happening right now is that there is dissatisfaction across the nation. I was in Michigan last week, and I talked Talk to a number of folks who are solid Democratic voters, plan to vote for the Democrats again come November, but they're not happy with the party. Right. They're not happy with the direction things are taking. And this <clears throat> frustration, it could keep folks from going to the polls, and midterms are all about turnout. So if you have folks who are out right. there and saying, you know what, it's just not worth it, that's going to be a huge hit for the Democrats. <clears throat> Emily Wilkins in Michigan last week scoring those Michigan State UCLA tickets for two years uh, from now. That will be a barn uh, burn. I've yet to hear a positive comment about UCLA. LA and USC joining the Big Ten. Uh, Emily, let me talk about a positive comment of the centrist Democrats and the president. How quickly is the president walking away from the liberals? I mean, it was very interesting to see a statement from the White House communications team over the weekend, basically defending the job that Biden has done in responding to the ending of uh, overturning of Roe versus Wade. This is something that uh, there's been a lot of concerns from more progressive groups of the party saying that Biden is not doing enough. And the response from the White House was, well, look, a lot of these groups that are pushing for him to do more are out of step with Main Street, mainstream Democrats. At the same time, though, you have the Biden administration saying that they might wind up enacting an executive order that would declare a public health emergency and would allow for abortions to happen nationally again now that we're back to a state-to-state -state basis. And so you kind of have these mixed messages at this point coming out of the White House. And I think this is really what they're trying to do. They need to make sure they're appealing to their base at this moment, but they also need to make sure that they're appealing to more moderate Democrats as well as independents at the same time. And it's hard to really find and craft a message that's going to appeal to both groups. And that kind of leads to this disjointed message that we see coming out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue right now. Emily, is the disjointment, joint, disjointedness, excuse me, I'll get my words out, disjointedness of this Washington, of this White House lead to an ineffectiveness of actually passing anything? And I talk about this with a whole host of bills still set to be passed, a pared down version of what President Biden initially proposed to help the economy. 
I think that question lies less in the White House and more at this point in Congress, particularly in the hands of Majority Leader Chuck Schumer as well as Senator Joe Manchin. They've been working in a number of closed door behind the scenes negotiations on things like health care, on Medicare solvency, on drug prices, on climate, on taxes, both corporate and global, trying to see if there is a way. You remember that whole Build Back Better package. I mean, that, that is dead, but they still have this vehicle where they can pass some major legislation with only Democrats voting for it. And the trick is they just need to get Manchin and Sinema on board while making sure that they don't alienate progressives in the House. But Lisa, when I talk to lawmakers, they say if we can get something at this point, it would be a win, even if it's far less than that $2.2 trillion package that was being discussed. So there is an eagerness to do something about this. It's just that the clock is running out. Lawmakers are back this week. They've got three weeks in July. Then they depart for all of August. And after that, things just get even more difficult to pass various items. So we're keeping a close eye on that. We're keeping a close eye on the U.S.-China manufacturing legislation, as well as defense funding and funding for the government. All of that needs to really happen within the next three weeks. So Congress has a lot on its plate. Emily, thank you. Emily Wilkins, the latest down in D.C. Here's one for you. Just got an email from Leon Cooperman. We all did ahead of your interview with him a little bit later this morning, Tom. Not his base case. I'm looking forward to hearing what his base case is. But he did talk about the downside. The downside is recession and the final bottom is 35 to 40 percent off the peak, Tom. The well, thoughts of Leon Cooperman coming up a little bit later on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. 35 and 40 percent, I, I would say, is, you know, the good historical measurement by Mr. Cooperman. He's lived that any number of times. And the question is, John, into this earnings season is how far are we along that bear market continuum? And that'll be a source of analysis here for the next 10 days. We're down about 18 or 19 yep. percent from the highs at the moment, Lisa, at the lows down about Dow 23. doing a little bit better. Yeah, the, well, that's exactly what I immediately want to do, is to calculate just how far down we were. We're about 19% off the highs. That means that we have a maximum drawdown of 21%. If we uh, look at his projection, if that's the case, is that actually more optimistic than some people who are seeing much bigger declines? And I don't mean to sound, you know, an uber bear, but uh, it just does seem to strike me that people are increasingly, especially veteran investors, are looking for opportunities. And the <clears> fact that they haven't stepped in yet Yet, tells you something about where we are. In that I would continuum. never accuse you of being super bearish, just to be yeah. very clear. To <laughs> and be the very, sky very, is never blue. To what? be very clear about that. <laughs> Thank you for CFA being so clear. level two, what's a veteran investor? Somebody's what's a veteran investor? Someone who's been around a while, Tom. Veteran investor. You're a veteran news anchor. The way that I meant it was through di many different economic cycles. Were you implying that I meant something else, Tom? I'm not sure what's wrong with him this morning. He's angel, the, the, you know, the tang, the, they raise the price of tang. You want to know the truth? You're upset. Yeah. Okay. Future's down a half of 1%. Do you want a Dow quote? <clears throat> squeeze it Yeah, in. please, get it in there. Oh, down negative 135 out of stick on the VIX. Nice. Do you feel better? I feel better. <laughs> Big week ahead. Say that a lot on a Monday, don't we? But there is Wednesday CPI. JP Morgan coming up on Thursday. Earnings season kicks off unofficially on Friday. Retail sales in America going into that futures negative six tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq last week, up more than four point five percent this morning, pulling back by three quarters of one percent. Earnings season at the epicenter of basically everything right now. For many of you, I know the likes of Mohammed Al Arian out on Friday suggesting that we could have an avalanche of earnings revisions over the next three to six months. Mohammed's view, though, on this market shaped by how sticky he thinks inflation will be. We had that conversation about 20 minutes ago on this program with Sonal Desai of Franklin Templeton. And this is what she had to say about inflation and what it means for this bond market. Inflation year end for her still close to 8 percent, 7.5 to 8 percent. For that reason, she thinks this Fed still needs to be aggressive, that hawkish surprises will still be in our future and that the volatility in this bond market is going nowhere. Last week, we had a move of 27 basis points higher on a two year. The week before, down about 23. It is very, very difficult to keep up with this bond market at the moment. It's perhaps easier to keep up with foreign exchange because it's moving in one direction. Dollar strength, dollar strength, <coughs> dollar strength. When do you take a look at the euro, whether you take a look at pound sterling or the Japanese yen, it's there for all to see. Euro dollar just about holding on to 101. Tom, dollar yen. 
Well, 137. yeah. And yen is the distinction for Global Wall Street greeting the week. It's real simple. Last week, yen quiescent, not now. There was an election there off of the shock of the Abe assassination. And, John, you know, well out over 137 and 138 would be shocking. We're not and there And cable yet. too, Tom, 119.54. So wherever you look this morning, dollar yeah. strength right the way through G10. And, Tom, as you've pointed out, <clears throat> EM as well. And that's the cross-asset price action this morning. Good morning. A special treat for you. She's back. And she's doing some single names. Good morning, Bramo. Thank you so much, John. Good morning. You've been trying to talk about this one name all morning, John. So let's talk about it. Twitter and the saga that's ongoing. Basically, Elon Musk tries to walk away from a deal. The, the board of Twitter says, not so fast. You need to buy these shares for $54.20. The share is currently $34.85 in pre-market trading. Basically, the market's saying he's not going to do it. What is the potential risk, the potential downside risk to Twitter? Some analysts coming out and saying possibly south of $30 a share, basically because of all of this back and forth. For Elon Musk also paying, he believed they have to pay a billion dollars as a potential best case scenario for the breakup fee. Uber also attracting headlines as possibly some impropriety uh, with respect to uh, lobbying for certain changes from 2013 to 2017. Those shares lower by 2.6%. And Alibaba, this really got my attention, down almost 4% after the Chinese authorities did assert some fines on some of their Chinese tech companies. How much does this indicate an ongoing tightening regardless of the economic backdrop over in China? And that really leads us to the other stocks that I'm watching, which is in the commodity space. The miners in particular, we talked about copper earlier in the show, uh, really getting a bid off, risk off, and we're, Dr. Copper definitely sending some negative signals for the economy. How much is this tied to China? Rio Tinto down 1.7%, BHP Group down 2.3%, and Freeport McMoran well well off the lows earlier today, down eight tenths of a percent. Tom. Lisa, thanks so much. I'm watching DXY while Lisa talks. We're about ready to go through to new strength on DXY from what we saw on Friday. Just a smart, stunning leg up here as, as Lisa started uh, the individual stock check. This is a joy and timely with dollar strength. Michael Scholl joins us now. Dr. Scholl out of Manchester uh, does uh, great interest in money and also in commodities and EM as well. Michael, I got eight ways to go here, and I'm going to go to one important idea in your note which is this time is different in that we are far along in the tightening cycle. What does that mean for Jerome Powell? You know, I think the great danger here is, is that the Fed tightens too much for financial markets. I, I think we're in a very tricky spot. You know, I, I think the sort of underlying economy, the labor market, obviously can withstand um, a fair amount more tightening. But, but financial markets here are wobbling. Um, and it's the dual nature of this tightening. It's, it's the combination of the withdrawal of liquidity and the increase of interest rates, which I think is starting to bother financial markets. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, my, my bet would be that, uh, that at some point in the next few months, maybe even the next few weeks, you know, we, we are heading for some kind of a financial accident, a break in financial markets. Oh. It really puts pressure on the Fed to do something different. Michael, you are and I are old enough where we remember the little red book, which was Stanley Fisher out of the IMF in 1998, writing IMF essays from a time of crisis. Folks, everyone in the game had to read that book at the time. And this was Fisher looking at the effect of EM redounding on the developed world. When you see rupiah, rupee, any other number of currencies, Chilean peso, unwind, what does that signal to you? Well, no, it's not like 97, 98. We, we don't have um, FX pegs to deal with. You know, I would say more than the EM currencies, but the really surprising thing is the weakness of other developed markets against the dollar. You know, the sort of stunning weakness, as you said, of the yen, of the euro, of, the euro, of sterling. And, and this sort of ability of, uh, of the dollar to just suck up all available liquidity. Um, you know, if we were going to have a 98 moment, I think Europe's more likely to be at the heart of it than East Asia this time. Michael, when you say something will break, and we can get to that Europe point in a moment because it's an important one, but when you say we could have a financial accident, what do you think that looks like? Have you got anything in mind? Well, I mean, it looks like very sharp downward moves in a number, you know, in a number of assets. You know, I, I mean, so far, what we've done is sort of blow the froth off the equity market and, and take yields up and you know, impose sort of very unpleasant losses on people. But, but by and large, people have lost what they've made in the last 12 to 18 months, which were themselves outsized gains. Mm -hmm. 
I, you know, I, I think the danger that we have is, 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 you know, I think credit's what we have to watch now. But if, you know, if credit markets start to dislocate at the speed that rates markets or, or, or sort of PEs have come down in equity markets, well, then I, I think that 2022 has the ability to impose the sorts of losses on people that they emotionally cannot withstand. And Michael, I guess um, that's what I'm trying to get to the point of. What's a dislocation? What's the difference between just the sell-off in the equity market, aggressive widening of credit spreads and a dislocation? And who would be an accident for? No, I think a dislocation is where you look at market prices and you really can't make sense of them. You know, you can make a great deal of sense of the reduction in PEs that we've seen so far. You know, you can argue they should be higher, you can argue they should be lower. But, you know, most of what we've seen so far has been, you know, understandable when one looks at earnings or when, when one looks at inflation. A dislocation is when markets, as they did in 97, in October, in 98, August through October, in 87, you know, it, it is a move in markets that really breaks its fundamental link. But you look at it and you're like, whoa, well, well, this, is just, this is just liquidity being withdrawn. Michael, this raises a question of when the Fed steps in, just to build on that point, especially if they still are trying to fight inflation that may not come down beyond 7.5%, if you believe, Sanal Desai of, uh, of Franklin Templeton. How do they come in and back away, even in the face of some of these dislocations that you expect? Very tricky. Um, you know, I think they take whatever success they can to the bank. You know, my guess is that, you know, you may see a moderation of some of the commodity inflation over a period like that. Um, and the Fed would use the excuse of looking forwards to do something different. Um, I, I also think the Fed has different mandates that it balances. It talks about the employment mandate and the inflation mandate a lot. But we all do understand that there is an implicit mandate to keep the financial system functioning at a, toler at a tolerable level. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that... You know, there are price levels at which, or, or speeds of movement at which the Federal Reserve would be forced to do something. There are also not the only central bank on the planet. Well, you know, you've got the Bank of Japan, PBOC, and, and, and the ECB to consider. To that point, I did want to follow up on what you said about the euro being the next real crisis and that will be akin to some of the emerging market fissures that we saw in previous years. How far along in this are we, and what is the potential contagion there? You know, very difficult to say. You know, I think Europe is, you know, was a mess going into this and, and, and continues to be a mess and, and has the additional strain now of, you know, sanctions on, on Russia and, you know, the potential for some, you know, some rationing of energy, you know, into the winter period. And that, that, that then does start to look a lot like the mid 1970s, where, you know, it wasn't just inflation that you had to deal with, but an actual shortage of, of energy available for general industrial activity. And, and consumer purposes. So, you know, as I say, but the Europe is a risk. It has poor political leadership. You know, the ECB is not an entirely credible central bank. And, uh, you know, I, I would say the euro itself is a, is a major currency, um, but for a lot of people, it's a voluntary currency. Um, so, you know, as I say, that, 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 you know, if we had a region pulling everything else lower, I think that's the region you, you need to watch out for. So, Michael, with that in mind, what are you buying right now? Um, you know, we're, we're still patient with, with energy. I, I still think that that's a sector that has, you know, that has value. Um, I think that, you know, as panic builds, you know, I think you'd want to be more aggressive. Um, I think that, that precious metals, I think, still have potential here. But the honest truth is, we're a lot less long today than we were six months ago. Um, and, you know, to have used recent strength to become less long than we were, you know, less long than we were a month ago. So, as I say, this looks like one of those times that, you know, whatever, whatever your mandate allows you to do, um, you know, you'll take your exposure down to more, I would say, cautious levels than in a normal market environment. Michael Schell, thank you, sir, for catching up with us. Market Field Asset Management CEO, Lisa, some big calls in that conversation, that's for sure. Yeah, talking about the likelihood of a fissure big enough to get the Fed's attention when the Fed's full attention is purely on inflation fighting. How much, how big does that fissure have to be and what's the knock-on effect? And the euro, though, I mean, honestly, that being the next epicenter of a crisis, really highlighting the angst in that region. And Tom, you wanted some gloom, some doom? I think that was it right there.
from Michael yeah, Shaw. Yeah, I, I think we well, I think we've seen it across a number of things. Take Sunel Desai and you know, combine it in with uh, Michael Shaw, and it, it speaks of the tensions of the morning. And again, John, dollar out to new strengths. Is this because Lisa came back? Was I, that, did, yes. did you arrange the yes. guest list this morning? <laughs> Yeah, it's the guest list. That's the problem. Maybe it's, it's reality. It's, ooh. What I've learned, John, ooh, is... Ooh, TK. That was a zinger. <laughs> Dacos is a, it's a bruschetta. It's a crazy bruschetta. Dacos is like this sort of cheese thing. I, we're down six tenths of one percent on the S and P. What what is that? What are you I talking about? You're talking about Bramo's trip to Greece. Yeah, she brought okay. some back. All right. <laughs> down eight tenths. She got you, you a gift. Yeah. Okay. They down eight tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq. All right. I got to go. From New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word on Ritika Gupta. The scene is set for a disruptive legal battle over the future of Twitter. Shares of the social media platform fell today after Elon Musk walked away from his $44 billion deal to buy the company. Musk alleges that Twitter misrepresented user data. Twitter plans to sue Musk to close the transaction. In Japan, the ruling coalition has expanded its majority in an upper house election. The vote was held two days after the killing of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who had led the bloc to numerous victories during his time in office. The results could strengthen Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's grip over the Liberal Democratic Party. President Biden's economic agenda is heading into a crucial month on Capitol Hill. Democrats are scrambling for a deal on a scaled-back version of what was once a multi-trillion dollar overhaul of domestic policy. The key, once again, is West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, who blocked an earlier version of the package. Democrats are hoping they can get him on board with a less expensive bill. And Uber reportedly tried to lobby politicians and flouted laws as part of efforts to expand globally from 2013 to 2017. Newspapers in the US, UK and France are amongst those reporting on the so-called Uber files. Uber doesn't deny any of the allegations, but says it is a different company today. Global News, 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg. Quick take, I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. For the moment, we don't expect negative growth this year or next year. On the baseline scenario, in the adverse scenario, which has to do with negative surprises on the energy front, we might have recession next year. This ECB hasn't exactly been ahead of the curve over the last few years, that's for sure. That was Yanis Tanaris there, the ECB Governing Council member from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures are down at seven tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down eight tenths of one percent. The main event for many of us is in the foreign exchange market. It's a clean breaker 101 now. On euro dollar 10089 down nine tenths of one percent on that currency pair the dollar index the dollar index is going back to levels we haven't seen since the fourth quarter of 2002 and this morning tom what if we had very very close to 108 on the dollar index 107 well, you know, keep talking we'll get there right I mean, now that's how fast it's something we're, else, we're, we're breaking out the new highs uh, right now and, and i would suggest that dxy is a major major currency index euro 54 57 percent of that and then yen uh behind john you look at euro 1.0088 and the difference today is the yen joins the uh, strong dollar parade. Who wants a weak currency right now, Tom, given where crude's trading, well, given I would the say energy it's more issues? Fear and something we've underplayed today is the virus in Macau and Shanghai. There's a backstory there, John, of maybe some new stridency given the new variants as well. Right now on hydrocarbons and for Global Wall Street, Will Kennedy joins executive editor for energy and commodities, which barely describes a herding of cats he does on an hourly basis uh, worldwide in a broad commodity market. Well, I got to go to the issue of the moment, which is natural gas in Europe. And what I'm curious about is a la Indonesia or the, the generational wheat subsidies in Egypt. Are we at a point where we're going to see government subsidies to consumers and businesses for energy? Well, I think you're starting to see them already, Tom. If you look at the UK, we're all being given uh, £600 or something this winter to subsidise our, uh, our utility bills. I think that's coming and has come all over Europe. I think governments are terrified about the hit that consumers are going to take this winter as gas 
costs continue to climb and that feeds through to the power market. And we're probably going to see more action to funnel uh, taxpayers' money back to taxpayers uh, to take the edge off. But it doesn't, it won't be able to make up all the pain here because <coughs> gas prices are rising very fast. I mean, we're in the UK, right. for example, we're likely to see a huge leap again in utility bills this October. I mean, you, you've got a second home in Houston the way you're traveling around, Will. Why, forget about the war, why is America have utilities that seem to be smoother for consumers than in Europe, where from every anecdotal evidence I have, Europe is a, is a utility stream to consumers of shocks? I, I think the answer lies again in, in gas. I mean, a lot of U.S. gas is being exported, and that is putting pressure on the U.K. energy system. But compared to Europe, a, a U.S. remains quite well uh, endowed with gas, and gas prices have risen, but they're cheaper. The Ukraine war is really being felt in Europe's gas market. Uh, flows from Russia into Europe have fallen through the main pipeline by 60%. We're not filling up our reserves like we need to. There's no real... Uh, idea about where we can replace all that gas this winter. LNG can take some of that strain, but not all of it. It's becoming a real crunch for Europe, and that's what's provided this enormous shock to the European utility industry. We also have price caps as well, Will, as you know, which means that we can keep a lid on things for a while and then things gap higher once those price caps are lifted. And Will, I understand we're going to get a repeat of that potentially in the UK later on this year. Well, we're all thinking about later on this year. We're all trying to anticipate what's going to happen with economic activity in Europe. And I'm trying to figure out, Will, whether in certain parts of the continent, whether we go to a four-day work week, Will, is that the direction of travel for you? There are lots of options in terms of managing demand, but I think the point is, as you say, John, that we will, on our current directory, need to do something to manage demand. There are obviously conversations with big users of uh, gas and power about how we can incentivize them to use less gas, manage when their factories are up, uh, and that will be part of the conversation. But if it gets really bad, yes, I think we will need a managed system of uh, cuts. Um, and one way to do that is to have a four-day week. We saw that in the 1970s with an earlier power crisis in the UK, which was to do with coal, not gas. But we went to a three-day week. Does anyone want this to happen? No. Are they hoping it won't happen? No. But as you look at the trajectory of this crisis, these kind of things are going to come onto the table. Well, is it already happening around the edges in Germany? And I ask this as you start to see some controls in terms of how high people can turn the heat ahead of the winter months and curbs on certain types of uh, usages as they try to store up enough gas to gird against a possible weaponization from Russia of those gas supplies. Yes, I mean, I think you will see a demand response. People living in slightly colder homes is one way that that's going to happen. People will turn down their thermostats or be worried about turning on their heating. We are starting to see it in industry. We, you know, there are very high uh, energy intensive industries that have had a demand response. We've seen uh, fertilizer plants can't close down in Europe. Uh, we've seen metal smelters, aluminium in particular, uses a huge amount of power, you know, ramped down. We will see more of that without a doubt. Um, but the danger for Germany, the most industrialized yeah. economy in Europe, is it spreads through to big John, mainstream parts of the industry like cars. I love John having Will Kennedy on because he says aluminium in Maryland like you do. I love that. <laughs> I was practicing. Is it Maryland? No, it's Maryland. Don't change Maryland. that. Maryland. Americans. I'm doing that right now. I'm offending someone I know. Will, Will Kennedy, we are, so, we are such idiots for the Bathian tone of your, your, your accent. It's like, John, it's like when Will's on, it's just like Downton Abbey. It's like when you say Birmingham <laughs> instead of Birmingham. Yeah. Tom. Will, thank you. Mary I've got Lynch. no idea where this is going. Pleasure. Will Kennedy, thank you, buddy. As always, the dollar index, I can speak to that, and I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, <clears throat> up eight-tenths of one percent on the DXY, Tom. We're getting yeah. close to 108 here, basically 107.90 as I look at the numbers at the moment. Monday Clinic, this is important, folks. This is something Global Wall Street sort of intuitively gets, but right now it matters. 108 goes back to the summer of 2002. That's a typo, folks. 2002. 20, 20 years back with a 108 print is where you are. That banner on television is wrong. Radio has the advantage right now, 2002. And, John, what's important is the makeup of the euro. In the DXY, it's 58% of the index. In the Bloomberg index, much broader, much better math. 
It's way down to a 31% level. Just to be clear, that banner was wrong because you wrote it. I, that's my annual I banner. I want to make sure the production team doesn't year. take the heat for that. The, the, I was I wrong. know. Mike Wilson right on cue over the weekend. He's writing in saying Lisa, I was wrong? No, on earnings and the US dollar. Yeah, basically saying that given the 16% appreciation in the dollar, plus or minus, probably plus at this point, given where it is right now, it translates into an 8% headwind for S&P uh, earnings, all other things Huge. being equal. Huge. This is not being accounted for. We have heard from companies warning against a possible uh, headwind from that strong dollar. Let's see it translate to the numbers later this week. Mike Wilson over the weekend. The recent rally in stocks is likely to fizzle out before too long. Enjoy your Sunday. Enjoy <laughs> your Sunday. I just love Mike. Enjoy your Sunday. Everything's going Enjoy going your going Sunday. Down. Futures are down three quarters of one percent. Enjoy your Monday on the NASDAQ 100. We're down nine tenths of one percent. Wiley of BlackRock coming up shortly in the next hour from New York. This is Bloomberg. What you have is a market that is very laser focused on getting recessionary signals. There's going to be risk in the market, right? The market is expecting the Fed to push us into a recession. The macro backdrop really remains pretty tumultuous. The economy is slowing, but the Fed wants it to slow. So I think all the recession talk is a little bit premature. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. The three of us back together again, at least for a number of hours. That's a good and beautiful uh, thing. Lots of economic data this week. No one cares. Right now, it's about the markets. John, strong dollar speaks volumes. Let's start with the data this week. CPI Wednesday, retail sales Friday. Someone cares about that later this week. Right now, I'm with you, Tom. Front and center, strong dollar. Euro dollar, a break of 101. The dollar index. Where are we heading towards now, Tom? On DXY, 108, <clears throat> maybe even higher. Well, spiking up, and we went through what we saw on Friday. George Cervellos rewriting and freshening before his appearance uh, with us. George Cervellos, John, making clear this is foreigners hoarding dollars in cash. These are not strategic moves. This is an edge of fear. And what don't they want right now? They don't want euros. They certainly don't want yen. And they certainly don't want sterling. <clears throat> what would the leaders of those respective central banks want, Tom? Right. I'm sure they would quite like a strong currency. They and don't have one. Reason to watch us for three hours here, a glorious four hours straight with me and John and, and, and all that. As you hear the previous guests frame out what we're going to hear with Wei Lee here in a moment. Michael Shaul, John, I Oof. thought that was critical how he removed the traditional EM analysis over to those weaker developed nations. He made two big points. Ultimately, this Fed's going to keep on hiking and there could be a financial accident, dislocations in places like credit. The second point was the point you just raised, that this time around, if there's going to be a massive issue, might not be in emerging markets, could well be in Europe. There are some real concerns about the energy story, not just in the here and now, Tom, but later this year as well. And I have no idea, I keep repeating this, I have no idea what the optimal policy for the ECB actually is, right. even if there is actually an optimal policy, and I have some doubts as to whether there is as well. John and I gauge in this with foreign exchange for the past two weeks. We have not looked at credit. We can do that with Bramo. Lisa, wonderful to have you back. And what is the dynamic now of credit versus full faith in credit. And the tension here is very strong. You have seen people piling back into credit. Last week, we saw the risk on, and it was uh, in tandem with what we saw in stocks. You saw a bid into corporate debt. How long can that last, given the volatility and the benchmark yields? And we heard that from Sanal Desai of uh, Franklin Templeton. How much can you really go into some of these riskier right. places if you're getting such massive moves in full faith in credit in one of the most liquid markets of the world? World. Okay, John, quickly here. Is is JP Morgan's guidance the big moment of the week, frankly? The first look by the mega Marco bank? Marco Klanovich. Yeah. We're looking for the equity report a little no, bit later. I mean, I mean, the CEO report. Diamond's going to get Oh, you right. Know, okay. Frame out earnings. <laughs> I, thought you meant, I thought you meant the equity strategist no, report a little you know, bit he's later. We typically get, I mean, we'll find out. It's very important to get guidance from a bank whose CEO told us a hurricane might be coming. I think it's very interesting to see what they actually yeah. see in the data. Yeah. I, I don't well want a weather said. forecast. I want to understand what's happening in the economy, and they're perfectly positioned to be talking about it. This yeah. morning it sounded so bearish. I have to say, there was one person that sounded just a, li a little bit more bullish on Friday. I wouldn't call him a bull. I'd just say a little bit more bullish than yeah. where he was. It was Rick Reader of BlackRock, and I'll share the quote with you. He said, if we're going to see a run rate of inflation over the next five to ten years a bit higher, three-ish, 
then you can buy high yield at 9% or 9.5%. You can buy investment grade quality in the front to medium part of the curve at 5%-ish. He said that's a pretty good real rate. So BlackRock has had this massive cash position yeah. and just slowly, I emphasize slowly, starting to put some of that money to work. Just something to think about. Up to date, I almost got two big figures. Quickly here, John, 26.45 sure. in the VIX. We're down three quarters of 1% on the S&P. On the NASDAQ 100, we're down nine tenths of 1%. Talked a lot about that dollar strength story already. Yields higher through last week. Just a bit lower this morning, Tom. Down three basis points. 3.05% on a 10-year. Wei Lee with us now with BlackRock. She's global chief investment strategist. Wei, please assist on the nuance to change here as you look mid-year to the rest of the year. Absolutely. So we're releasing our second half of the year outlook today. And the main theme here is really that we are in a regime change, uh, that the great moderation of the past for decades characterized by uh, steadily growing production and the environment driven by supply. Well, that is now over because we're now in an environment, uh, well, the, the, the environment driven by demand was over because we're now in an environment driven by supply. And that means actually the trade-off between growth and inflation is so much tougher. And whichever way central banks act, either to live with inflation or to fight inflation by hurting growth, we're going to be looking at a worse set of outcome for growth and inflation. And that is also why through the course of this year, we have been incrementally reducing portfolio level risk taking. And at this juncture, we reduce portfolio level risk further. And in this uh, moment, we are actually applying a uh, up in quality adjustment to portfolio by downgrading developed market equities further into underweight and upgrading investment grade into uh, uh, overweight at this juncture. So, Willie, talk to me about the future then and the characteristics of this new market regime, given everything you've just said. Is it lower returns and higher volatility as far as the eye can see? Is that the way you're thinking about things beyond this year into next year and after that? Well, in this new regime, when it comes to investment, I think the most important implication to remember is that the Goldilocks outcome is now off the table. The Goldilocks outcome whereby you have sustained and joined bull markets in equities and bonds, uh, which is very much what characterized uh, recent decades. Well, that is now off the table. And when it comes to portfolio construction, we're talking about higher risk premium for equities and bonds. We're talking about no automatic buy the dip. We're talking about re-evaluating risk models calibrated to history. And we're also talking about being more dynamic when it comes to adjusting portfolios, right? Because cycles are becoming shorter, macro volatility is higher, and market volatility is higher as well. So I just mentioned the adjustment that we're making, downgrading developed market equities and upgrading uh, global IG investment grade. But we do not expect to hold it for an extended period of time. When we would exit this bear market, when, would we, when we would become more positive, actually, there's a super big call that we're very, very focused on, and we're signposting that uh, explicitly in the outlook as well. So, Wei, how much is your bullishness on certain instruments of credit hinged on this belief of a Fed put that if there is a big enough dislocation in this area, the Fed will step in versus equities where they will not? At this juncture, is a hinging on valuation in that when we talk about downgrading equities and upgrading credit, equity by our assessment is uh, reflecting, thinking about the correction in equity so far this year, it's reflecting hawkish Fed repricing, but it's not reflecting growth stalling and earnings stalling, whereas credit at this juncture already prices in a version of a mild growth stalling, and it's offering attractive yield for the first time in over a decade. So this is why we are kind of comfortable getting into credit. But another reason, you talked about Fed put, actually, it's related, but, uh, but, but, but uh, slightly different. We are not expecting uh, the default profile to blow up, right, as we head into growth slowdown. We actually are quite comfortable with a reasonably contained default outlook for credit, uh, IG in particular. And that's why even as we head into growth <coughs> slowing down and the risk of the central banks over tightening, we want to uh, own credit to reflect this up in quality adjustment in portfolios. How much is the dollar a key component away of your call, given how much strength we've already seen and some of the concerns about the overweights in that area? 
yeah, the dollar has been a, a, a challenging a challenge to kind of earnings outlook, as you heard, as I heard in the previous uh, segment as well. And so far, the dollar has been a good place to kind of hide as we think about building portfolio resilience. But given the very good performance so far this year, I think it's uh, there, there is limited expectation to how much more it can come to the rescue as yeah. we think about building portfolio uh, portfolio resilience. So uh, we, yeah. we, we, we definitely kind of think about dollar and international diversification as we construct this global portfolio. You know, John, I think that, that we're into the inner sanctum here. For those of you on radio, behind Wei Li is some extremely sophisticated math. John, behind her is either time reversal invariance of Lambda, or it's a formula to order pizza at BlackRock. I don't know which it is. Is that you, Wei Lee, or is that John Bravan? Who's responsible for that mess behind you? <laughs> It's John and myself. It's really around this trade-off between growth and inflation and how we are exiting the great moderation and into an environment that is a lot tougher in terms of uh, the, the, the higher volatility, macro volatility, and the trade-off between growth and inflation. Very cool. Best That's backdrop the real of the world, week. John. That's far, the real world. Already, easily. Wayley of BlackRock, thank you. Tom, I've just been making a list of some of the things people have told us this morning. Well, Lee of BlackRock yeah. just there. The Goldilocks outcome is off the table. They've downgraded developed market equities even further. Marcus Schaul, Michael Schaul of Market Field in the last hour or so. We could face a market accident. At the start of the show, Sonal Desire, Franklin Templeton, we're pricing in rate cuts next year way too soon, too early to buy risk assets. Pretty bearish start to the week from our guest, Tom. These are institutional buy side. And to see Sonal Desai, acclaimed Morningstar Manager of the Year, you know, link in with Wei Li there, John, on the measurement of what now after the great moderation, that maybe is the raging debate of spring of next year. Everybody on Lisa's page, just like that. <clears throat> Ramo, perfectly lined up this morning. It is. It's just amazing. There is a very big concern when you see inflation and you hear the likes of Sonal Desai say that we could get down to 7.5% yes. or 8% by year end. To me, that was the call that really stood out in my mind. What does the Fed do with that? Very, very interesting to hear from everybody, including Lisa Brambitz. <coughs> Grandma, we missed you. Aww. It's great to have you I back. You I have no idea why you're leaving us again next week, but we're not happy about it. But just about? to be very clear, what is it about? I'm not jet setting. I'm going to be, you know, caravanning around she in a canoe in Tupper Lake. You're caravanning yeah. around in a, in a canoe. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I look good forward memories. to the coverage of that. <laughs> okay. The deer flies away. <laughs> That's six tenths of one percent of the S&P from New York. Don't miss this. George Saravelos of Deutsche Bank of Foreign Exchange with a rip roar in dollar this morning. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Shares of Twitter are falling today. The company is preparing to go to court to force Elon Musk to follow through with his commitment to buy it for $44 billion. Bloomberg's learned that a filing in the Delaware Court of Chancery could happen as soon as today. The court has rarely sided with parties who, like Musk, are attempting to bail on acquisition commitments. In the UK, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss is the latest to enter the race to replace Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. Truss is making tax cuts at the heart of her campaign. She wrote in the Daily Telegraph that she would start cutting taxes from day one. She joins 10 other candidates in the race. The timetable for the leadership contest is expected to be set out late today. President Biden says the administration is still discussing possible action regarding U.S. tariffs on Chinese imports. The U.S. is considering easing some of the Trump era duties. Meanwhile, the president and Chinese leader Xi Jinping are set to speak again in the coming weeks. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke with China's foreign minister over the weekend to lay the groundwork for a call. And Broadcom is losing one of its most senior executives. That's a blow to the chipmaker as it attempts to close one of the biggest deals in history, software, uh, in technology history. Software group chief Tim Krauss is leaving to join an unnamed company. CEO Hoptan will assume his responsibilities. In May, Broadcom agreed to buy cloud computing company VMware for $61 billion. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Richard Gupta. This is Boomback. We're calling for a technical recession in the first half of this year. So we, we had a negative Q1 GDP growth. We expect negative Q2 GDP growth. Uh, but we're expecting the economy to bounce back in the second half of the year 
avoid a more conventional recession this year and eventually fall into recession next year. You got all that whipsawed by weakness. Matt Lazzetti there, the chief U.S. economist at Deutsche Bank, looking ahead for the U.S. economy from New York City this morning. Good morning, Tom Keane, Lisa Bramberts and Jonathan Farrow. Futures negative on the S&P on the Nasdaq 2 right across the board. We are lower by 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P. We're down by 8 or 9 tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. Treasuries rallying just a little bit off the lows of last week. Yields just a little bit lower after creeping higher through pretty much all of last week, down three basis points right now 3.0449% on a 10 year and back to 101 on euro dollar these moves in foreign exchange they get your attention right. don't they Tom we're down eight tenths of one percent on the single currency against the U.S. dollar the distinction today is a link up here with yen weaker as well 137.39 is critical a 138 print would be truly shocking George Cerevelis has been out front on this with global head of foreign exchange research at Deutsche Bank with a note published worldwide moments ago. There are real interest rates, nominal interest rates, George Cervellis, there are capital flows, and then there is the thermodynamic statics of the hoarding of dollars. What is the importance of a static hoarding of dollars versus normative flows in the global economy? Hi, Tom. Uh, so I think it's extremely important because if you look at what happened this year, you've had a very big regime shift in the market. Uh, currencies were generally uh, pretty highly correlated to interest rate differentials uh, up until March. So you had the more hawkish Fed, um, the dollar was rallying. Um, then the ECB turned more hawkish and the rate differential actually turned uh, significantly higher in favor of the euro. Uh, but the euro failed to follow and the market more broadly has stopped being responsive um, to the interest rate differential and is instead a lot more sensitive to the flow dynamics um, you discussed. And what we're seeing globally is uh, essentially a huge hoarding of dollars uh, from investors. Um, Europe obviously is uh, really burdened at the moment by this huge energy crisis. Um, Japan also has the energy problems plus the BOJ, which is easing aggressively. Uh, and the conclusion the market has is it's just hoarding onto dollars. Even if investors are selling U.S. assets, uh, they're selling U.S. equities and bonds, as we're seeing, it's just not being repatriated back. And, for example, that's one reason why the yen is no longer a safe haven. So, George, let's focus on the euro. How low can that currency pair go, one? And two, are rate hikes from this ECB bullish or bearish for that currency? Well, your last question is an interesting one. If, if you look at the UK, the Bank of England was one of the first currencies, uh, one of the first uh, central banks to hike rates, and that really didn't benefit. Um, you've seen the RBA, Sweden, all turn hawkish. Um, so I would say at the moment, um, central bank reaction functions, rate hikes don't seem to matter all that much. And it's a lot more about the underlying energy balance. Um, how far can it go? I just crunched some numbers uh, in, in a piece this morning. Uh, if you map out the extra energy deterioration on the back of this big um, spike in natural gas prices, that's worth about 200 billion euros extra of supply into the market. Roughly speaking, that equates to euro dollar at parity. Uh, but of course, these are only rough estimates and numbers. When you look at how much the euro has overshot uh, in the past, uh, we've come up with a range of anywhere between 95 and parity. And I think in the current environment, um, that sort of range is, is not really unreasonable. This is actually piling on to what Citigroup was calling for as well, a 95 on the euro should this gas ban go into effect with some sort of weaponization. At what point does that become your base case versus a bearish outlier? At what point do you have conviction around it, given that Germany is already starting to tweak how it's handling a potential lack of gas supplies down at the end of the year? So um, when an outcome rests so much on uh, what would happen out of Russia and President Putin, it's very difficult to, to have a base case. I think th the best thing we can do at the moment is just put numbers around the different uh, scenarios. And under the scenario of a complete um, gas cutoff, I, I really wouldn't say 95 would be unreasonable. But we can just see how unpredictable things are. Up until three weeks ago, nat gas prices were much lower and, and the flows um, we're, we're, we're going through that pipe. So it is all about the Nord Stream pipeline. Um, what I would say, however, now the market has built a risk premium uh, because it knows there's uncertainty, it knows it can be switched off. So even if this gas returns in terms of um, full flow after the maintenance period, the risk premium is unlikely to go away. And I think that's a critical thing that's changed over the last few weeks. George, to your point, we can do a bunch of scenario studies, but you have to understand what regime we're in. 
and what matters to foreign exchange and what doesn't. And to your point, it's not been about rates so much as it's been about flows. So, George, do you think it's going to stay that way? Is the reason to believe it stays that way? Because the recession scenario stuff, all the scenario analysis, whatever it is, that's helpful. But unless we understand what's actually driving the underlying currency, who knows where this goes? Absolutely. And what's driving the dollar at the moment is safe haven flows. The dollar is the, the so-called risk parity antipole. And I think you would need two things for that to change. Um, the Fed um, being more sensitive to growth. And at the moment, that's not the case. They're very growth agnostic, so to speak. The U.S. data is slowing, but they're still talking about 3%. So number one, a shift from the Fed. And number two, a change in the energy dynamics, especially as they relate uh, to euro and the yen. So I don't really see the current environment changing, which is why we, we pushed down our euro dollar forecasts um, in recent months. Um, the last point I'd make, everyone is talking about this um, recession. Um, I'd argue uh, the recession should be a given. Indeed, the market's already pricing it. It's now a question of length and depth. Yeah. And uh, the second half of the year is all going to be about that learning process amidst an extremely unusual environment. For example, the growth data is slowing. The labor markets globally are extremely tight and strong. And people talk about the U.S. If you look at the Canadian data, the unemployment rate built a huge record low and, and dropped sharply. And it's these things central banks are looking at, and th they would need to see the labor markets overall turn, I think, before we start talking about a more dovish pivot. George, super interesting stuff, as always. George Saravelos there of Deutsche Bank. TK, when it comes to Europe right now, we are all forecasting the price of gas. If you're forecasting oh. the euro, if you've yeah. got a call on the equity market, a call on the economy, uh, uh, underline that as a call on the price of gas. I would go there. But, but John, across all this is the importance of the economic data we're going to cover this week. And, and, and as George mentioned, they're in Canada and they're fully employed unemployment rate. All the data matters here because the uncertainty and the where are we right now is off the chart. And I think there's been a real preponderance of gloom here today. To be fair, there's some people really pushing against that gloom. Lisa, it's not one of them. Lisa, you're FX market. You're a dollar. Lisa's laughing. Well, <laughs> you're a dollar 101 right now. Okay, look, there is a, definitely an upside down the line. <clears throat> I think when you start to talk about the volatility in this benchmark currency pair, how does a company arrange around that, right? I mean, we sort of dovetail that into earnings and the projections. How do companies give guidance when it depends on the price of gas in Europe and what that does to the dollar? And what are we looking to earnings season for guidance? looking for guidance in a world yeah, where I it's, think it's hard all, to provide like, any. Like it's never been before. Yep. We're down six tenths of one percent on the S&P. Yields are lower by four or five basis points. Your tenure just north of three percent. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Ton of economic days are coming up this week. We'll get to that in just a moment. Here's the price action to kick off a brand new trading week stateside. Futures negative six tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, we are lower by three quarters of 1%. Yields are heading south, down four or five basis points to 3.03% on a 10 year. This euro, a whole lot weaker. This dollar, a whole lot stronger throughout the whole of G10. Euro dollar, a clean breaker, 101, 100. 9.1 on euro dollar. That currency pair is negative nine tenths of 1%. City published just moments ago. Here's the take from then. Ton of jobs added in June. This is their take. It does not change the view that the Fed is focused on slowing the economy to tame inflation, materially raising the risk of recession in 23. In fact, the very tight job market may make it much more difficult, Tom, to obtain right. a soft landing. Oh, this is there. This is out front. And of course, Andrew Hollenhorst leading the way with a shocking report. What, John, nine months ago? When he came out calling yeah. for big rate hikes from this Federal Reserve. Way lonely. Several way months lonely ago, at yeah. The time. Veronica Clark works with Dr. Hollenhorst uh, out of Chapel Hill. She's global markets economist at Citigroup as well. Veronica, what does a 70 beat point lift here? actually do to our viewers and listeners i get that it's an economic exercise it keeps financial media employed but what's it actually do yeah i mean for for the fed at least they're going to see that 75 basis points is at least getting back to to neutral of course for for consumers you know they've already experienced mortgage rates that have skyrocketed you know rates on on just about everything that have already priced that in um and at this point it's just a matter of the fed following through on that what do bonds do with the Citigroup economic outlook? Yeah, I mean, so we're, we're not expecting 
you know, a near-term recession, of course. Um, we do still expect the, the Fed can be more hawkish here, really just responding to, to high inflation. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see yields that are still moving higher. Um, you know, as we're getting, you know, markets, of course, are cutting, are pricing cuts as we're getting into, you know, later next year. Um, but this really just comes down to inflation. And if inflation stays high, the Fed might not be able to cut. Um, and so we do still see some upside for yields here. Veronica, can you respond to Michael Shaul's point that there could be some sort of financial accident, nay, that there actually will be a financial accident in the next couple of months simply because of how quickly things are moving and how much tightening is getting affected and that the Fed will ultimately have to respond to that. What's your view on how high the threshold is for some sort of step in there by the central bank? Yeah, it's really it's really hard to know when when you know the Fed is moving so quickly, and this is unlike you know something that we've seen in a long time. Um, that that's certainly possible. I think ultimately the Fed's reaction function though will still come down to what we're seeing in the real economy. So you know, number one, that being inflation, um, and then number two, if there is some you know dramatic weakening in the labor market, um, they've told us they're just focused on inflation for right now. But I don't think we have the best sense of their reaction function if labor market does weaken more. How much does the labor market have to weaken to get inflation down to the 2% level that the Fed is looking for? Yeah, so I mean, of course, according to their latest forecast in the, the summary of economic projections, they do have the unemployment rate you know, coming up above 4%. Um, and that's consistent, of course, with their projections that show inflation getting closer to target. Um, I would say the risk, though, is that you need to see maybe at least a whole percentage point rise in the unemployment rate you know, as we're getting into next year, and that that will be what cools inflation. What does trade do? I mean, if there's a domestic calculus in the you know the core equation y equals c plus i plus g, what does NX do within the Holland Horse view? Yeah, I mean, we've had really strong imports you know over the last year, and that's just tied to you know really strong domestic demand. Um, of course, that's what weighed on Q1 GDP growth. So if you're expecting domestic demand to slow, you would expect to see trade volumes also to slow. Um, so that could mean, you know, weaker imports as we're getting into later this year. And and we've already seen some of that, you know, happening over the last couple months. So in the inflation mix, what does the mix do is people guess game the move from goods over to services inflation dynamics fit that into your view of much higher yields? Yeah, so this is what we're really starting to see in the inflation data over the last couple of months. And, and what I would expect that we're seeing in the second half of this year is we've seen goods prices that are softer. Um, and that's in, in autos and furniture and, and things like that. Um, but we've seen this rotation away from really strong goods inflation towards really strong services inflation. Um, and that, that last CPI report that we got for May, um, we saw shelter prices that, that jumped again. Um, those should probably stay strong. And then just other services prices that are that are now rising you know, more substantially, and that's just tied to really tight labor markets, um, which is a more worrisome you know, scenario for the Fed, even if you have this goods price inflation that's slowing, services could actually matter a lot more. I want to partition Veronica, the Veronica Clark call, the Citigroup call with the Sinal Desai call for inflation remaining yes. above 7% or uh, ending the year at 75 to 8% of this year, even with some of the tightening that we're seeing from the Fed. Does that cohere with what you're calling for? So for, for if that's headline CPI inflation, yeah, that's about consistent with what we have. Um, some of that is, you know, gas prices maybe that are coming off more in the end of the year, goods inflation that's coming off more. Um, but we do have that, that strong services. And of course, services are two thirds of core inflation. Um, so for something like headline CPI, yeah, you can definitely see that. Um, core PCE inflation, of course, that the, the Fed watches, we have that ending this year around 4.7%. Um, that's about where it is now, um, coming down more in 2023. Um, but the risk is, yeah, it just stays higher for longer. So what brings that rate down quickly to that 2% level, unless it's a recession that's pretty deep? I mean, honestly, I'm just looking at this. If you're looking at 75 to 8% by year end, that is flashing warning signals for a central bank very much still scarred from what happened in the 70s. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that 70s episode is is definitely influencing the Fed here. You know, they don't want inflation expectations to become unanchored, and they actually have to see inflation cooling. Um, so that definitely does, you know, pose recession risks as we're getting into next year. I think what's underlying a lot of forecasts right now, and what's underlying ours, is this goods price slowing. Um, that, of course, was a pretty big driver of, of high inflation over the last year. And if that comes down, then maybe you can get you know the, the total reading down a bit. Um, but the longer it stays high, yeah, that's a greater recession risk. Yeah, Veronica, in securities analysis, you have to have a risk to your call. 
in your economics, your domestic economics, what is the risk to the Citigroup call where we don't get such a large interest rate move? Yeah, if, if we don't, if, you know, our call, of course, is, is for rates to go above 4% next year, policy rates to go above 4%. If that isn't happening, I imagine it's because the labor market has weakened faster than we're expecting. Um, of course, we had the jobs report last Friday that all looked very strong still. Um, but that, those jobs numbers are maybe some of the last to turn when we're going into, you know, a, north, a steeper slowdown. We have seen initial jobless claims that have maybe come up a bit. Um, so if we are starting to see the labor market weaken more, um, I would imagine the, the Fed is much more uncomfortable with that. And maybe that does you know, create a pause then. Veronica, if you could make a list of the most important data points this week and at the top was CPI, can you elaborate on what you think number two is? Yeah, so CPI, of course, on Wednesday, number one. Um, a very close second will be the University of Michigan survey on Friday, especially that five to 10 year inflation expectations measure. Um, of course, that in the preliminary reading last month came up to 3.3%. It was revised lower to 3.1, um, but I do think that scared a lot of Fed members into realizing that those longer term inflation expectations are at risk of, of moving higher, you know, potentially becoming unanchored. Um, so markets, I'm sure, will be very focused on that. Number amazing. Five. Amazing. Veronica Clark of Citigroup. Veronica, <laughs> you and a whole of the team over at Citi, great work over the last few months on this Federal Reserve. Thank you. To hear that on a week where we've got retail sales, that the number two data point of the week is actually you Mitch consumer expectations and Lisa that was the difference Federal Reserve basically told us that between a 50 basis point hike and mm. 75 that's what it's come down to it's this is where some of the volatility is coming from right the fact that we have to look at stuff like that it shows the fear of the 1970s repeat, the fear of entrenched expectations, the fear of expectations driving a cycle that's much more pernicious and difficult for the Fed to fight. And it highlights the deep uncertainty in how you track the now that's moving so quickly when so much of the data is backward looking. And John, I think that that is what it indicates at a time when companies are going to attempt to give guidance at a very murky point. Right now history. we need the TK camp because mm. TK... I, I hear the TK I, I, I get going. <laughs> Look, the only thing between now and the 1970s is we really need a redux of Bob Seeger. Other than that, I just don't buy the idea. It's like the dismal 70s. I'm not saying that it is. You just said that. It's, I'm saying you know, that that's the fear entrenched oh, I, in some of the fear. movement. I, I, just, I just don't buy it as well. John, we got to focus. What a joy to have Lisa with us for five days. <laughs> I, I mean, John, it's great because I'm you know, happy to have Bramo back. She's coming up. She's going up north. She's going to wear the little white Hudson Bay blanket coat. Okay. She's going to be out there in the birch bark canoe. And what's great is she's doing the 90 miler this year. What is the 90 Three, miler? You go north from Old Forge up to Saranac on the way to Tupper. Okay. And like day two is like that's the one. Okay. The 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 the, the, the is portage that park, is car, not that long. Canoe. How do you do that journey? You, you do well day two you're going north out of blue mountain lake and right. i'm telling you it's forever you know she's got to get the, she's gonna have to have the gloves on you get calluses blisters i love tom's reliving of his that's his youth his <laughs> his scars from portaging through my vacation plans and i'm looking right now at uh yeah. you know trying to you know have family time quality that. time john the yeah, worst the part woods. about the worst part about the adirondacks is all the tang is warm this is how Tom no spent the 70s. This is why he doesn't want to talk about it. 70s, yeah, Exactly. That's why no, it's John. different. I, go back I, was being little, kind. I was being kind. I was there right after Theodore Roosevelt was named president. <laughs> he was a veteran. Okay. Portager. I'm going to yes. do the markets, all right? We're down three quarters of 1% on the S&P, down about seven cents on a NASDAQ 100. If you're just tuning in, we're down eight cents of 1%. The main event for us through most John, of this John, look at the dollar. It's been this move wow. in the US dollar. Euro dollar there. with a clean break of 101. 10079. And we're looking ahead to earnings season, Sue. We're going to do that with Stuart Kaiser of UBS on the open in about 20 Jack. minutes. And Tom, I know you've got a special guest coming up on this program in about four minutes. Well, we do. Mr. Cooperman's going to drop by. But, John, you should stick around and we can blow the break because we're going to go through 108 here any second. I think we probably are, Tom, given the direction of travel, yeah. if not in a second, perhaps over the next 24 wow. hours. Wow, wow, wow. From New York City with Tom Keane and Bramo for just four more days, apparently. <clears throat> And then you go for a week and then you're back with us for She's good? Got a then there's no more vacation. No more. You've used up the vacation. <laughs> OK. From New York, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. The scene is set for a disruptive legal battle over the future of Twitter. Shares of the social media platform fell today after Elon Musk walked away from his $44 billion deal to buy the company. Musk alleges that Twitter misrepresented user data. Twitter plans to sue Musk to close the transaction. In Japan, the ruling coalition has expanded its majority in an upper house election. The vote was held two days after the killing of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who led the bloc to numerous victories during his time in office. The results could strengthen Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's grip over the Liberal Democratic Party. And President Biden's economic agenda is heading into a crucial month on Capitol Hill. Democrats are scrambling for a deal on a scaled-back version of what was once a multi-trillion dollar overhaul of domestic policy. The key once again is West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, who blocked an earlier version of the package. Democrats are hoping they can get him on board with a less expensive bill. And in London, uh, UK, London's Heathrow Airport has apologised for travel disruptions caused by staff shortages. The airport warns it may ask airlines to cut flights from their summer schedules if the chaos continues. Heathrow has been plagued by long lines for security and baggage that has gone missing or arrived late. Uber reportedly tried to lobby politicians and flouted laws as part of efforts to expand globally from 2013 to 2017. Newspapers in the US, UK and France are amongst those reporting on the so-called Uber files. Uber doesn't deny any of the allegations, but says it is a different company today. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. You can't just look at the data and say, that tells me what to do. You have to take all that information and say, okay, we need to get inflation down. How do we both try to get, look at all the data and get the right, the best approach to do that, but also manage risks. And, you know, and the risk today is really inflation getting stuck too high. Mm -hmm. And we really need to make sure that that doesn't happen. John Williams, the New York Fed president at the University of Puerto Rico, managing the message forward. I'm sure we'll get a lot of that. Uh, coming up here. If you're just joining us right now, some deterioration of the tape in the last hour as well. Dow futures negative 130 are now negative 200. The VIX 26.42. Uh, We're going to go through 108 on DXY. We're not there uh, yet. This is a joy for Lisa Bramowitz and myself. Leon Cooperman is chairman. He is chief executive officer of Omega Family Office, and he's shy about talking about his track record. And, Leon, I say this with everybody in your uncle this week coming out saying, vote for me in the institutional investor uh, a beauty fest here in late summer. Leon Cooperman, folks, for like 47 years was named head research strategist by institutional investor uh, at a tour of duty with uh, Goldman Sachs a few years ago. Leon, I want to talk about the character of this bear market. And you and I do that with a bond overlay we've never seen, which is bond price down, yield up. The losses in bonds are extraordinary. How does that redound over to a stock bear market? Well, actually, I would take a slightly different approach. I'm shocked that interest rates are as low as they are. You know, for most of my career, there was a real return associated with buying a bond. The bond nominal yield was in excess of inflation. We have an inflation rate in this country, called 8%. You have real growth, a couple percent. So you have nominal GDP growing at 10%, and you have the 10-year bond at 3%. Makes no sense. And that makes everything in the stock market look attractive. The stock so, market you know, looks attractive. What part looks attractive to you, or are you in the triple leveraged all cash fund? No, I, I'm basically, I'm of the view that equities are the best house in the financial asset neighborhood, but I don't like the neighborhood for a lot of reasons. So I, I have a cautious view. I've been a seller on strength and not a buyer on weakness. I think that ultimately the price of oil or the Fed or maybe the strong dollar uh, will lead us into a recession. And when the recession hits, which will be a 2023 event when it hits, not 2022, that the market will find the bottom somewhere between 35 and 40 percent below its peak of 4,800. And I think coming on the program and having, <clears throat> excuse me, a cautious view is not value added. So I differentiate myself. I talk about the Faro, 
you know, I don't know what you know about the Bible, Tom, but the Pharaoh had a dream. The dream was interpreted by Joseph. And the dream was we were going to have seven lean years following the seven fat years. I'm not making a seven-year forecast, but what I'm saying is uh, I would be very, very surprised if we went into a new bull market anytime soon. And we've just been through the most speculative period in our financial history. You know, SPACs, uh, 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 would-be, you know, um, FANGs, yeah. uh, zero commissions, zero yeah. interest rates. Yeah. We just saw an extraordinary <clears throat> speculative period. And right. uh, we're not going into a right. bull market. Lisa, soon. what's so important here is we can't have the Coopermont angle because the seven years of abundance led by the seven years of famine. Lisa, that doesn't get it done for us. We'll have to uh, put the exodus aside and <clears throat> talk you. about uh, what we're looking for in terms of the safety during the seven years of leanness. And, and you talked about bonds and the surprise that yields were so low, uh, particularly benchmark rates. What is the safety if it's not? Not bonds. Oh, I would think uh, undervalued common stocks. I'd rather be in a common stock than I would be in a bond any day of the week, given the relative price of bonds versus equities. Well, can you Look, buy what we, what, we got to, what we got to understand is stocks are very heterogeneous. Bonds are homogeneous. What I mean by that is a triple A bond, double A bond, they'll all trade within a quarter point of each other. Stocks uh, are heterogeneous. You know, I look at a Citibank at seven times earnings and discount the book. Bank of America at nine times earnings. Apollo, uh, the uh, financial service company at eight times earnings. Uh, you know, I, I, my, I, I'm doing relatively well this year because I have a big energy exposure. And I had breakfast with the CEO of a company called Paramount Resources up in Canada. And the stock's gone from two to like uh, 28. And I was wondering whether I should take some money off the table. When I got finished talking to the CEO, I, I figured I, I ought to add to my position. This is a company that generates uh, over 3% dividend yield, sells at three times cash earnings, and it's growing production double digits, um, and uh, they have something like uh, $10, $11, 12 of cash flow, uh, trading at uh, like three times cash flow. And they have a portfolio of other, other energy holdings that are equal to $5 per share. Well the irony, I, I'm very negative on bonds. My biggest position is a bond, but it's very complex. But I, 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 I happen to think it's like a layup. I could be dead wrong. It's a company called Legato. They have first lien debt outstanding, 15.5% coupon. With a make whole provision, you're paid interest to the end of 2023 when the bond matures. And these are very real people. They have very real assets. When I say real people, the chairman of the board is Ivan Seidenberg, formerly head of Verizon. Reed Hunt, formerly head of the FCC, is on the board. Yeah. And Mr. Donahue, who is number two guy to Craig McCord, Bill McCord, Cellular is on the board. Very Lee, real people. Yes. There's so yeah. much of the specific story here that's important to talk about and discern. Let's talk about the bear case or the recession call of a 40% drawdown from the peak, which is about 20% further than where we are today in the S&P. What leads things lower if there are these positive stories of whether it's undervalued financials, as you said, or whether it's undervalued or at least uh, fairly valued uh, energy companies? Well, I'm a, I'm a classicist. You know, uh, let's face it, we, we have recessions. We used to have recessions every four or five years, but because of very liberal policies, it's been stretched out. But if we have a recession, uh, typically you have a bear market preceding a recession. And, uh, you know, we're in a bear market already. And the question is, we're probing for the bottom. And uh, I think given the excesses that we've had, uh, having a bottom 35 or 40 percent below the peak would not be an unreasonable guess. <clears throat> Multiples that would right. be sued from that not unreasonable. You know, uh, let's face it, everybody's using the wrong profit estimate. You know, I think someone in your program this morning said every one percentage point improvement in the dollar is about 8 percent off of earnings. Uh, well, let's so talk about that, Leon Cooperman. You have seen dollar bouts. I, you know, I believe you were in the meetings of the Plaza Court a few years ago. What does a strong dollar mean for our viewers and our listeners? Negative for corporate profits. We already got a, a profit warning out of Microsoft on the strong dollar. And, uh, you know, in a recession, profits typically drop 20 percent. I don't see any uh, uh, estimates that would have earnings on the S&P 500 comfortably right. below 200. Leon, help me with institutional money and what they do with whatever part of their portfolio was bonds and those bond losses. We have guest after guest after guest rationalizing a bond bear market, do this, do this, do this, do this, fine. 
But the fact is, on an actuarial assumption, even if you have a formal one or you don't, boy, are you underwater off that bond bear market. What do you do? Shift the stocks? Well, uh, I would say it's a combination of cash and stocks. That would be my answer. You know, I'm in a different position. I'm approaching 80 years of age. I don't have any clients. I run my own money. I could take a longer term horizon. And I, I, I recognize that in the bear market, he who loses right. least wins. He who loses least wins. We all Leon, lose in the market. Leon, at your August age of 79 and holding, should President Biden serve a second term? Give us the Cooperman energy level as the nation considers a second term for the president. I, I think he definitely should not run, and I don't think he will run. I am told by people that he's not happy in Washington. He's spending more time with his grandkids in Delaware. You know, uh, he has not done a good job. I voted for him because I voted my values and not my pocketbook. And uh, I found Trump, who has superior economic ideas to Biden, his conduct was just totally unacceptable. And uh, But I think the Democrats are going to get crushed in December. Uh, the progressives have led them too far to the left. The country is centrist in nature. And uh, we got to we got to start working together. We got to start cooperating. Leon, and, you know, Leon. let me if I make make yeah, this point, right? it's not about politics, but I, I, I in a sense, I would smile on my face, blame a good man by the name of Barack Obama for a lot of these problems. I don't think that Bush one or Bush two, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton villainized wealth. He villainized wealth. And I sent him a letter 12 years ago that went viral on the Internet. Yeah, I remember that. OK, and I said to him, Mr. President, you're telling the 99 percent they're being screwed by the 1 percent. You should be telling the 99 percent with hard work and luck they could become part of the 1 percent. You're depreciating the American dream. Now, unfortunately, President Biden has picked up on that theme. Right. I see no reason to villainize wealth. How do you get to be wealthy? You develop a part well, of the service the world needs. And, Leon, we would note St. Barnabas Hospital in a small state of New Jersey as well. Leon Cooperman with Omega, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Greatly appreciate that as well. Lisa, what an odd day. I'll be honest, Lisa, when I walked in the door here this morning at 542, I did not expect this kind of Monday. A tumultuous day in the FX channel. How much is that the channel that breaks? And I go back to what Michael Shaul said. I, today was fascinating to me. Some of the calls that we were hearing, and yes, there was a lot of gloom, but there was a lot of discussion about whether something will break, what the Fed response will be to that, and a regime shift. That, to me, was the narrative oh. of the day, <clears throat> sort of to that biblical uh, Leon Cooperman call for seven lean uh, right. years following the seven uh, fat ones. I'm going to go back to one of the essays of the weekend, Barry Eichengreed, writing for Project Syndicate in the Guardian. And, you know, he walked through the four bouts of sterling weakness going back, I believe, Lisa, uh, to the Depression. And we've seen that in the last 10 minutes. 119.18 on sterling, driving DXY right up against 108 as well. And to me, that's a summary as while you were gone for two weeks, Lisa, okay. John and I were focused on those emerging markets, which is Europe and, and the United Kingdom. Yeah, well, that's the shocking part of this. And how much is that going to be the epicenter of the weakness that drags things down? These are not regions that can save their currencies and strengthen them right. through policy actions. Right. What gives and what is the potential contagion falling out? Lisa, we have had a firestorm of interest by global Wall Street and particularly the young lads of the Northeastern Corridor over your sojourn up to the Adirondacks. One emails in and says, but can she light a Coleman lantern? Oh, yeah. Can you do the Coleman lantern oh, yeah, thing no with a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, ooh, that's good. Did I do that okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it kind of like has a new sound when you put the, uh, yeah. put the my match father, My is... father would have me stay 50 feet away. So <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be interesting. Today well, we're definitely going to be watching the dollar, though not necessarily my sojourns. An important there. interview this morning, the 11 a.m. hour. A lot of talk about the gentle lady of Rhode Island. The Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, with Bloomberg this morning. Futures, negative 27. Good morning.